Today, for the very first time, believe it or not, I am going to finally hear Metallica's Ride the Lightning. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another album review slash reaction here on my channel. If this is the first time you've seen a video on my channel, no, you are here for a very special occasion. First and most obvious thing that's very different, if you're familiar with my channel, is that I have another human being here with me. This is my friend Chris. Hi. For those of you who are unfamiliar with my channel, I'm Patrick, and this is my channel where I usually post myself, just by myself, listening to albums that I've never heard. And for the most part, what I do is newer albums, albums that have just come out or were released at least within the last year or so. That's generally what I tend to do on my channel usually with the intention of trying to build my top 12 albums of the year list at the end of the year. And so I originally started doing these reactions because I didn't have any friends or anyone to listen to music with. And so I thought I'll just film them myself and share it with people and see if anybody wants to watch them. And some people like to tell me how terrible I am, you know, with my opinions about like Blue October, for example, and how stupid they are that their vocals were spread wide. But whatever, we don't need to get into that. We're here to talk about Metallica. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not salty about the negative comments at all. Please leave as many negative comments as you want. Leave Comment anything below any comment <laughs> any comment what's terrible ones right? are encouraged <laughs> <laughs> so so i am a huge metal fan i would say that in general metal is the genre of music that i listen to i don't know if i could say i listen to it the most but it's very close i listen to all genres of music and if you look on my channel here you'll see that i've done reactions to all sorts of things like one of my favorite bands of all time, The Birthday Massacre, which is sort of like synth rock, like dark gothic synth rock. But then I do like The Wallflowers, The Black Keys, uh, other Dan Auerbach projects. I've done, uh, actually I posted it, but it got removed due to copyright reasons. The most recent Casey Musgraves album that won uh, Grammy or whatever a couple years ago. Um, so I'll do all sorts of stuff on this channel. But very rarely do I go back in time and listen to maybe what would be considered a classic album by people. But I decided I wanted to do this. I kind of wanted to do something special at the beginning of the year here on my channel. And once Lux Eterna, the Metallica single that was released, uh, I don't even know how long ago at that point. Ago. A couple weeks, or maybe even like a month maybe and a half at this ago. point. Because I think it was back in December. There was another one that came out. Just I know, I haven't listened to that one yet. Because I've already listened to one song and I don't want to ruin any more of the album. Because okay. I am planning on listening to the brand new Metallica album, 72 Seasons, I think it's called. And I believe it comes out in April, I think the middle to end of April, which is also the same time the new Depeche Mode album comes out. So we're going to have a fantastic month for like <laughs> bands that have been around for 40 plus years, still creating music. So, right, Metallica, when did their first album come out? Just like just 40 years 40 ago. 40 years ago. Yeah. And, and Depeche Mode's first album was 1981. So awesome. Really cool. Uh, but... To celebrate the release of 72 Seasons, I thought that I would maybe correct a little bit of an area in my musical palette that has never been colored in, which is the original Metallica albums. Uh, the only Metallica album that I know of that I've heard is their Black album, the, the their self-titled debut, not debut, <laughs> their self-titled album from 1991, which it shocks me that this album is from 1991, Chris. Uh, okay, so I may be getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Uh, we're going to be doing Metallica, as I said. I wanted to do some of their back catalog leading up to 72 seasons. So the purpose of this video, as I'm sure you've seen in the in the title, is that we are going to sit here and listen to Ride the Lightning for the very first time. And so know that we're going to talk a little bit at the beginning of the video, and then we're going to listen to the entire album, and then we're going to do sort of our thoughts on the album as, as afterwards, like as a whole. This will be the first time I've ever heard, I think, any of the songs off of this. I don't think I've heard any of this. Did they? What was their big single off this album? Let's look at the track listing. I got it pulled up. So I know I've never. Oh, maybe oh, I have heard. heard you've heard. heard the belt I think I might have sure. heard. Pong probably trapped under ice. No, I've never heard that. I don't even know what that is. I do know I've seen people reference Creeping Death as like their favorite Metallica song. Because sometimes I watch those Loudwire interviews with metal bands. Do you ever watch those on no. the Loudwire channel? Dude, Loudwire's uh, YouTube channel is awesome. They'll just go to like festivals and have metal bands come into their little booth and they'll ask them like questions about metal things. Like, do you uh, think it's okay for bands, people to wear metal shirts if they're not metal fans, you know? Or like, what's the heaviest riff of all time? Or who's the 
worst metal vocalist of all time. And so then they'll just have these bands in like costume ready to go on stage, sitting there on this couch answering questions. And a lot of people were asking, what's the best Metallica song? I watched one recently and they were saying Creeping Death was a lot of people's favorites. One of their a lot of people mentioned Creeping Death, at least. Uh, but as I look at the track listing here, eight songs. I think it's eight total. Yeah, eight songs, which is not very much. However, I do know that back in the day, Metallica had longer uh, songs. But again, I feel like I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I wanted to just mention that we're going to talk about the album afterwards as a whole. But I will have in the description of this video timestamps so you can skip to each individual song plus the different sections because I want us to talk a little bit about Metallica in general here at the beginning of the video. But if you don't want to hear me and you don't want to hear us ramble on about that, feel free to skip to any of the sections of the video that you want to. Like I said, if you have a favorite song, you can just skip. Just look at the timestamps on the timeline of the video and you'll be able to skip whatever you want to. Also, I have to say right away to just finish my little business stuff here. I hope fingers crossed that I'm able to use the actual audio from the album in this video so that you watching this video will be able to hear exactly what we're hearing. However, there's a good chance that Metallica being a, probably the biggest metal band of all time and being on whatever record label they were on at this time, I don't even know, like they might not own the copyrights to these particular specific songs and be able to control what people can use and can't use on YouTube. So if I have to upload this video without any music in it, know that I am very sorry for that. We'll try to do it in such a way that we have, I very clearly will have labeled on screen what we're listening to. So if you want to listen along with us, whether we're pausing between songs and stuff, we haven't exactly decided what we're going to do, but I will always clearly have labeled on screen exactly what we're listening to. So you'll be able to listen along with us if I can include the audio from the album in the video. So, okay, those are the two things I wanted to mention beforehand. Now we can get back into talking about Metallica. Okay. So, like I said, as I have the track listing pulled up here, For Whom the Bell Tolls is a very famous song. And in my head, I can kind of hear James Hetfield going, For Whom the Bell Tolls, or something like that. It sounds just like I that. I guess, yeah. Uh, <laughs> just, I'm sure, a spinning image. But other than that, like, I don't really know. I do not think I've heard a second ever of Ride the Lightning. And I, I don't really know any of these other songs at all. Like, it's funny to see that they have a song called Call of Cthulhu or whatever, because Cthulhu is such like a huge, famous, like pop icon thing now. It's interesting to think. I mean, obviously, uh, Lovecraft was like a big popular thing always and has influenced a lot of metal music. But yeah. like, I feel like when we were in high school and since like 2005 to 2015, I feel like there was like a big Lovecraft resurgence kind of happened. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting to, though, to think that back in 1984, 84, good Lord, two years before we were born. My goodness. But back in 1984 that they had like Cthulhu was a, a reference for them, like something that was inspirational to them or whatever. And so you think trapped under ice is like a thing I might recognize too. Yeah. I don't know if I, I've never heard that ever. I guess, I mean, I might know once I yeah, hear it, yeah, yeah. but I've, to me, my knowledge, never heard any, Trapped Under Ice. That doesn't sound familiar to me in any capacity. Okay. So, um, so that's interesting, but I, I will also say too, while we're looking at the track listing, the longest song is almost nine minutes and it's the last song, but a lot of the other ones aren't as long as I thought they were going to be. Like the total length of the album is 47 minutes though. That's a lot for, for eight, eight songs. I mean, there's a five minute song, a six and a half minute song, a f another five minute song. But there's two songs that are around four minutes, like four, less than four and a half, though. But there is, I guess, another seven. So all of the songs are relatively long lengths, but there's only three songs that I would consider to be like long, long. Oh, I guess there's not. There's a six and a half, a six and a half, a seven minute and a nine minute. So those three songs right there add up to probably over a half hour or so. So I will say that is something that I'm kind of excited about. And I mentioned in our last video that we'll never post because we can't because <laughs> we screwed up when we were recording it. But I, I mentioned that. Oh, no, that was our sleep token. We did it. We were we, re we reacted to a sleep token video not long ago. And I mentioned that I've been getting a little bit more into prog metal, prog rock. And I listened to the most recent Riverside album, which really blew me away. And um, I've been listening to like Avatarium. I've been listening to certain other things, even like more doomy metal. That's a little bit progressive as well. Like witchcraft, things like that. They have a lot of songs that are six plus minutes with lots of long musical interludes and things and solos. And that's what I expect from this. And like I, like I said, I, I should reiterate this. Like I am a big fan of metal, but this is just somehow I've never heard any of this stuff. 
which I know is really weird because I'm sure that all of the metal bands that I love, they were, I'm sure, all influenced by Metallica. And the funny thing about it, too, is like I, I really do think that one of the first albums that I ever bought was the Black Album. Um, and so I just never had the desire, I guess, to ever go back in time and, I, and, and listen to their older stuff. And then I was aware of their singles that they had, like when I was in high school and stuff. That's why it's so crazy to me that this the Black Album came out in 1991, because I wasn't in high school till 2000. And so the first Metallica song that I would have been really aware of and that I specifically remember was their I Disappear song off the Mission Impossible soundtrack. So that's like probably the Metallica individual Metallica song that I know the most outside of Black Album is the I Disappear song, which I don't think was on any of their albums. Yeah. But I think it was recorded around the same time as um, Load and Reload. Yeah, that but, makes but sense. Load, Load was 1996 and Reload was 1997. We just, just looked that up here a second ago because the only other Metallica CD that I do have a copy of is load and i just bought this recently at a goodwill for 90 for 50 cents and um i've never i haven't listened to it yet because i was kind of just waiting until to see like if this video gets a lot of views and stuff on my channel and people really like the fact that i'm listening to metallica for the first time then i could go through and do other metallica albums too though i know most people don't really look favorably upon load and reload right yes so i guess one other thing i should say right away is one of the reasons i asked chris to be here is because chris way more than me even is like a metal guy. Like you're, you have the whole like metal aesthetic, like always constantly, <laughs> you know, like if you have long hair, it's maybe you can't tell in the video, but like Chris has long hair that he uses to headbang in his bands, his metal bands that he per is a performer of in doing lead vocals and playing guitar and stuff. So like you are very much more of like a practicing metal dude than me. You know, I can go probably for maybe even months without really listening to any metal at all. Whereas I feel like you don't do that, right? Like you just pretty constantly listen to metal stuff. Yeah, pretty much. But I also know that you're not like huge into listening to tons of like new music all the time. Uh, but I do know that you do listen to new stuff at work and and you have a one of the one of the cool things that I think is really awesome about Chris is that he is also now for the last few years a teacher. And what is what is your teaching title exactly exactly? Like, I teach in the audio by audio and recording technology yeah. or whatever it's called. That's what it was at our school. Audio engineering right. or something like that. That's the degree we both have. That's how I met you initially was when we were both going to college. Uh, we both got our audio engineering degrees, but then you stayed an extra year and got a music a degree in music as well. Let's go with that. Well, you did though. Or at least you stayed there. I don't know whether you got your degree or not, <laughs> but you stayed there an extra year and took music classes that I never took, which I thought was, which I was a little, was really cool that you did that. I thought, cause I wish I would have taken more metal music classes, but I've never been like a performer, like a music performer, but you've played guitar forever and you were even in jazz band and stuff at the college yep. and, and you've been in metal bands and you were in a punk band and all this stuff for a long time. Yep. So you've always been involved with metal music. And so um, I know that you like Metallica and you were like a big fan of Metallica, but to what extent, I don't really know exactly. I'm not like a diehard fan. I don't have a shrine in my house. I have right. friends that have Metallica shrines in yeah. the house, but that's not me. Yeah, I know that Metallica fans, like Metallica fans are like a whole fan base unto themselves. Very similar to like certain, like Slipknot fans are their, their own like group of people. Insane Clown Posse fans are like their own group of people. And I feel like Metallica fans kind of like maybe more akin to like Black Sabbath or something. Like it always kind of bothers me when people are like, what's the best metal band of all time? And people are like Black Sabbath. It's like, what? How could you say that? Like, it's so, yes, I suppose you could say that the first band that was like a metal band deserves props for being like the first metal band. But like, come on. Black Sabbath, the best metal band? Get out of here. But so leave your comments below. <laughs> I know that might be kind of controversial. <laughs> but but I guess what I mean though is like to me, when I think of like metal music and this is I know that this is wrong, but like when I think of metal music from before like 1991, I think of like White Snake. And like yeah, but that wasn't like that was that's metal all, in the sake of like that we're I know. talking about metal now. I know, but that's what I think of. Yeah. Like I think of hair metal. Like that to me, all metal it, from like before 19 before grunge became a thing was like happy hair metal, like Motley Crue and stuff like that. And I know that Metallica wasn't like that. I know that there were like thrash bands and there's like I was watching a documentary about doom metal the other day and they were talking about one of the first doom metal albums was from like 1984 or something like that. 
And so I was like, I think you could argue that some of the early Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath for sure, for metal. sure. And that stuff was like early, like 70s. Yeah, in the 70s. And so like, for sure. So like, I'm aware of those things. But for my perception of stuff, like it even blows my mind that the Black Album was 1991. Because to me, it seems like that album could have been released like late 90s. When the music that I started to listen to to get into heavy music, like Rob Zombie and Power Man 5000 and Korn and Coal Chamber and all that kind of stuff, that stuff sounds way closer to like black album Metallica Mm -hmm. than like metal stuff you know and like I know Metallica is hailed as like one of the bands that kind of like started uh, like I don't think they started but they're like mainstream like thrash stuff right yeah kind of they have like thrashy aspects to them but like I I couldn't tell you like a song that they have that's like a thrash song or anything like that so I'm assuming what we're going to hear on this Ride the Lightning is going to be thrashier and faster, but I'm also expecting lots of long guitar solos that are probably pretty intricate and complex. And I don't really have any basis for why I think that I just (laughs) from hearing things and like Metallica is like one of those things that like, like I've never seen any of the star Wars movies. Right. But I know that Darth Vader was Luke's father. And I know they go, there's like a Padawan thing and there's like these Wookiee things. And there's like little Wookiee things that are creatures that do the thing. Ewoks. Right. The Ewoks. And I know Luke Skywalker and, and uh, Anakin. And like, I know all this pop culture stuff about star Wars, but I don't really know or care about the story of star Wars. Right. So like, it's kind of the same thing with Metallica, like Metallica is so famous and I was aware of certain things at the time. I I think I might even talk to you once before about how, how can like the biggest band basically of all time, you could maybe even make an argument, especially in the metal genre. How could they have like terrible sounding albums when they are so famous and could work with anybody they want? How could they have albums that are regarded as sounding like really bad? Like I, I can see that in the eighties before they became that. But like, I'm talking about like St. Anger, right? Which like, I have heard a few songs from St. Anger and I really like their song frantic. It's one of my favorite Metallica songs of the like 10 I've heard outside of black album, Yeah, you know, but like the only other Metallica songs I know are frantic St. Anger, um, King, nothing. I disappear, which is the song from mission impossible. I don't know anything off of their two most recent albums. Oh. Not a single song. I don't hear anything off that Lulu project or whatever that you always joke about. It's not Metallica. I don't know anything about that. And then I think they had an album. I, I've, I, I distinctly remember going to your place once when we were working on music and we were talking about Metallica and I was talking to you, I think about Nightwish specifically. And you were like, you like metal bands with orchestras. Do you, have you heard of S and M? And I'm like, what is that? And you showed me, you made me sit down and listen to some of Metallica S and M, which I think is now that I'm getting into Metallica more, probably will be my favorite Metallica stuff whenever I get around to it. But the thing that bothers me about that is like, they never actually released an album though. Right. Like yeah. it's just the live stuff though. Right. It's just, it is, it is live. It's, it's okay. I, I mean, know it I sounds haven't listened great. to it for a while. It probably but, like, sounds it's really probably, good. It's, it's probably fine. But what I, what I was mentioning a little bit ago though, is like, it's weird to me that Metallica can be so important. And so such like a pop culture icons and things. And then they have like albums that apparently sound really bad. So so that's one thing that like really surprises me about Metallica. And I know that like, I know, like, I, I think I can even say like the members of Metallica are James Hetfield, Lars Ulrich, right? Mm-hmm. Kirk Hammett is the mm-hmm. guitar player, mm-hmm. right? He's the guy that with the floofy hair mm-hmm. still, he looks like a, a hair metal guy. Though I think they all had like floofy hair back in the day, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So they all had floofy hair, but Kirk has kept his floofy hair. And then Jason Newstead was the bassist. But Cliff Not on Burton this record. was Cliff the first Burton's bassist. the bassist that's on this record. Okay, and then he left after Master of Puppets, right? Or died? Did he die? Cliff died. Cliff died, yes. right. And then Jason Newstead joined the band, uh-huh. and that was when I became aware of Metallica uh-huh. after that, because that would have been Black Album era. Yeah. And I remember seeing him on, like, MTV and stuff, and... I, I can picture Jason Newstead. He, I, in my head, I equate him to like Bam Margera. <laughs> it's like the same kind of a thing. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's weird, but I guess whatever. I was a big like MTV guy when I was in high school and like I watched lots of Fuse and stuff like that. So, um, but again, that would have been around the time of I Disappear. Yep. So that would have been like Metallica, Metallica, Mission Impossible. And then the new bassist is, he also has long hair. He does. It's very nice, slick, long hair. Not foofy at all. Uh, 
what is his name? Robert Shurio. Ro- okay. Ro- okay. Robert. Okay. So, so like, I do know the guys that are in the band. I know lots of people like imitate the way James sings. I don't know if, if when we listen to ride the lightning here, if James is going to sound the same way he sounds on black album, I would imagine not. I would, I would think that it would be more hair metal-y in my, the way I'm perceiving it. Okay. I don't know if we're going to hear any like distorted screaming vocals at all. Okay. Like, I think it's going to be mostly now. I know that James has a way of singing that is like a little bit more raspy. So like, I expect that, but I also, I expect higher pitched vocals and I expect there to be no, like no death metal at all. Like no growling or grunting or any of that. Okay. Because I don't think any of that was really done before 1996 or whatever. That's not true. I know, but that's what I'm saying. That's my perception of stuff. <laughs> like, I know that there are things that existed before that, but it always shocks me when I hear something that sounds heavy to me. And it's from like before 1995, which I know is so wrong, but it's just, that was just my perception for such a long time that it's hard for me to imagine that like, but of course, but then I also know that Metallica is super influential. So I don't know if I'll be hearing things and being like, oh, this sounds like Children of Bodom or whatever, for example. You know, because Children of Bodom, one of the other metal bands that I love that really utilizes leads a lot. A lot of the metal that I listen to, there may, might not even be any solos at all in a lot of the metal that I listen to. Um, some of it does have solos, but for the most part, the solos are just like they're what I would assume will be way shorter solo sections than what we're going to get here or maybe even Master of Puppets when we get to that album. Um, because usually it'll be like just 16 bar solo or whatever. So just like two go rounds of a half of a verse or whatever, mm-hmm. rather than like a whole section of the song that is going to be like, here's a new section of the song. And it's just a giant guitar solo for however long. I don't know. I also don't know if it's going to be just shredding guitar solos, which to me, I find to be very boring. Like I want a guitar solo to like, I like it when it's technical and they're shredding and I don't care if it's just like there's cool sweeps and stuff and trilling and whatnot. And you and I have recorded so many guitar solos over the years that uh, it's it's fun. And I but I definitely feel like I can appreciate that kind of stuff a lot more now, which is, I think, one of the reasons I was able to get it into more progressive music now recently, Mm -hmm. because I'm expecting this to be more proggy like long songs with different sections. And I don't know if we're going to get choruses that repeat a bunch. I would hope people who watch my channel will know that I very much like music that is structured A, B, A, C, B, or, you know, verse, intro, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, outro. That's what I want the structure of every song to be. I expect the songs on this album to not be that, to be something vastly different. I don't know why. Again, I don't know why. I know I've heard parts of For Whom the Bell Tolls, but I don't know what the song structuring is at all or anything like that. And I can't think of like a riff or anything like that. So I have no clue. I expect lots of like fast guitar riffs because a lot of things like I really enjoyed Lux Eterna a lot. Did yeah. you did you like it? Uh, yeah, I, I did. Now, but you how do you feel about how do you feel about Metallica in general? I guess you talk a little bit about it. I like Metallica. I like Metallica. Yeah. There are some things that I really like and there are some things that um, but I think that that's part of what makes Metallica great is that they do terrible things um, I like the Lulu thing or whatever. Yeah. And then like load and reload. I didn't really care for that either. And is that just because it was way more mainstreamy? I don't know. I like I just um, it just I think that it was probably shocking to people because it wasn't. But was Black Album shocking? I at some point there was I mean I wasn't like because like when I listen when that was I mean when I listen to Black Album to me like I think of nothing else matters sad but true enter Sandman now I know that there are thrashy faster songs in between all those songs yeah but do people really care about those songs or is it just nothing else matters um I mean there was a lot of hits on that record right I I think I mean really it's Part of disgusting is, how many hits there are. The whole, and I think that a lot of this discussion that we've been having is like it's, uh, it just uh, makes a bigger point that how big of how big of an album the Black Album was because yeah. right there's been how many reissues of that CD they've made bajillions of those CDs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I mean, Enter Sandman is probably one of the most played songs, and I don't mean performed live, but like Enter Sandman is probably one of the most famous songs of the last. 50 years, if not of all time. 
Yeah. I mean, they yeah. play it at stadiums in every sport you could imagine. Like everybody knows Enter Sandman. The reason this might be interesting to people, the reason that I initially bought the Black Album, which I thought when I purchased this that it had come out like in 1997 when I went and bought it. I thought it had just come out at that point. But the reason I bought it was because in ECW, the Sandman came out to enter Sandman. Um, and he would come out through the crowd and have a beer can and smash it on his head and be bleeding all over everything with his Singapore cane, as they called him in ECW, kendo sticks now. And so like a lot of my gateway into heavy music and just music in general was through wrestling because it was such a huge influence on me growing up and still is even though the music is a lot more garbage now. Back in the day, they used to just use songs. And ECW especially would just use songs from bands without their permission. And they would just play them live. And then when they became a TV show and started airing on national television, they couldn't use a lot of the songs that they were using because they would get in legal trouble. Yeah. But Enter Sandman was one they just kept using. And I guess the people... Because I know also that like Lars, they had like a big snafu about like Napster and stuff back in the day. Like Metallica was like known for being like, like they hated deal. stuff like that and whatnot, which I can understand. Um, so like I, I understand, but you would think that they would never let some stupid little wrestling company from Philadelphia use their song on national television without giving them any royalties or whatever. But, but anyway, that's how I found out about who Metallica was when I was like, you know, we're talking probably I was 12, 13 or so at the time, I would guess maybe even a little younger. And I'm, um, bought this because of that. And then years later, I would, you know, they would Undertaker would come out to Sad But True, but Kid Rock's version, American Badass, right? So, like, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. And I don't really have a problem with Kid Rock. I think some of his music's really great. But but I know it's people who love Metallica probably laugh at Kid Rock. So, But I'm one of those rare people that, like, enjoys all this stuff. So, like, to me, I don't ever, like, scoff at stuff. But, like, I totally understand. No, that's one of my favorite jokes to do when Sad But True comes on. is to, like, tap everybody and be like, dude, they're playing Kid Rock Kid right Rock. now. <laughs> right? And, like, yeah. <laughs> For sure. For sure. And I love that kind of stuff. It's great. Yeah. But, but like, that I don't know. Like, I guess that's kind of one of the reasons my perception of Metallica was messed up at first. Because I thought that this album was much newer than it was for years, even after I bought it. Because I was just a dumb kid that didn't look at, like, oh, it says 1991 on the back of the CD. Like, it had never occurred to me that it was that old. And then I, I distinctly remember learning that White Zombie's album, Astro Creep 2000, was from 1995. And having that just, like, explode my mind. Because I didn't think that music like that existed before, like, 1998 which is so stupid, but that's how I was thinking. Then to learn that Metallica's Black Album, which is similar to that kind of stuff, the new metal stuff that I grew up liking in high, in high school, that's what the Black Album is. A lot of it is like new metal, basically, right? I mean, it's just very simple riffs that repeat all the time, and he doesn't ever scream. Yeah. But then there's those faster songs in between, like Holier Than Thou Are and Twisting, Turning Through the Never and all that stuff. Like, So there are faster songs, and so I'm expecting like the entirety of Ride the Lightning to be that like fast pummeling, but not pummeling like double bass, but like, I, I don't know what I'm expecting the drums to do, to be honest. Like, I, I, it's so funny. Like, I was trying to think to myself and I was like, if you asked me, like, did any band ever use like double bass before like 1991? Would I say yes? I'd be like, no, <laughs> which I know that that's not true. <laughs> like, I know that there were really cool. Like, you know, I just none of that music ever came across me because I've said before on my channel, like I love my entire love of music comes from just me. Like I had no one in my life that enjoyed music at all until I moved to college. I didn't know anybody that cared about music at all to any degree until right. I moved to college. So everything that I have that I that I like from before I went to college and started learning more about music, like theory and stuff, is just from what I found on my own. Like no one ever told me anything about any of this stuff. And so like the idea that there were like real metal bands or thrash metal bands or death metal bands or whatever before 1991 is just still such a foreign concept to me. And I know I want to just point out to the people watching, like, I know we're probably going on a little bit long here, but like, I personally love watching videos of people talking about stuff like this. Like, I think I'm in like a really unique situation because I understand and know a lot about metal, but I've never heard Metallica's early albums. Like how many metal like, I feel like I'm, I am have enough credit to That's be like a real great. metal person, you know, with all the music that I like and the my last year and my top 12 albums. Like, I think half of my albums last year were heavy albums. 
on my list. And Allegiance Damnum was my number 11 on my list. And I think that's the heaviest album that I've ever considered to be on my top 12 albums of the year list. And I think that's one of the best metal albums I've ever heard. And it is definitely one of the most intense and brutal albums I've ever heard. And for me to enjoy it as much, I feel like that says that's how like that's how far I can extend myself into the realm of like super heavy stuff. And it's not even like I know there's like way more brutal stuff than that. That has clean vocals in it, you know, yeah. but not a lot. But it's still incredibly brutal and fast and technical. Um, but then to go all the way back to like my favorite other genre of music is like electronic music. You know what I mean? It's like the f- exact opposite of that. So, <laughs> well, is it though? Elect- the type of electronic music I listen well, to. I, yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I like the stuff with square wave synths and pounding bass drums. And I think part of the reason I like that is because... Yo, yeah. Well, it's metal-ish. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, Skrillex was a metal dude and then started the dubstep craze. And I remember seeing an interview with... Oh, this is stupid, but I remember seeing an interview with Tommy Lee at the time talking about on MTV or something about um, dubstep and about how he went to a dubstep, a Skrillex show. And he said the crowd was acting like people do at a metal show. Yeah. And he had never thought that that would be possible at an electronic show. And now that's Tommy Lee being a, you know, a somewhat old guy at the time, not maybe necessarily being super connected to like the music pop modern music but like i've been to see infected mushroom like infected mushroom one of my favorite bands one of my favorite groups of all time and they make sci sci uh like psychedelic trance music but they have a whole album where it's based off of guitars and it's really awesome and there's metal aspects to that so like i totally get what you're saying but when i say electronic music that i like it is so far from metal music that that it isn't really not like that but i mean obviously whatever I'm, i'm just saying that like I feel like I'm in like a somewhat unique position, ha- not having ever heard these albums, but like, I'm not going to be like the reactor channel where it's just some like, you know, two 20 year old kids sitting down who have only listened to rap their entire life. And then they listen to Metallica and their minds are blown. Right. Like, that's not what you're getting here. Like I under, I hopefully will understand what we're listening to and my mind will be blown because I didn't know that stuff like that existed in 1984 I didn't know that it w- that it was like I'm hoping that we listen to this and I go wow this is why In Flames sounds the way they do this is why Soilwork sounds the way they do this is why all the bands that were important to me growing up why they sound the way that they do even though I know that a lot of those bands were more influenced by Iron Maiden than Metallica because I've read interviews with them when they have said that but was did Iron was Iron Maiden influenced by Metallica the other way. Really? Iron Maiden was before Metallica? Well, they were both sort of releasing Around the same time? through the 80s, but I think that I'm sure that Iron Maiden's, yeah, absolutely. I don't remember what the first Iron Maiden hmm. album was, but I'm guaranteed, I'm sure it came out before Ride the Lightning. I need to watch some documentaries or something about just like metal music in general, because I feel like I don't have a very good understanding of the early days of metal. Like, obviously, I know Black Sabbath, but then what would be the next big metal thing after Black Sabbath? Iron Maiden, Judas Priest. Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, and Metallica. Mm-hmm. And those were all about the same time in the, in the 80s. Yeah, and I think that Metallica was after that. I mean, it depends on if you're looking at this more, because all the stuff that we've been talking about is a little bit more mainstream. Um, right. Because we're, I mean, we're not even talking about Slayer, which right, is or sli- only slightly less mainstream. And, uh, like, Death was putting out records in the 80s, and that's, mm-hmm. like, that was the birth of extreme metal, for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. And that's... Right, and I don't know any Slayer. Not a oh. single Rain and Blood, maybe was the only Slayer song that I know, right? We should, just, we should do this for Rain and Blood. <laughs> I, I would listen to Slayer. I love Rain and Blood. I just don't know if I would enjoy Slayer, <laughs> Slayer that much. Now, I do know also Sepultura was like an important band. Yeah, that was later. But that might be later. Yeah. Okay. Um, see, that's the thing. Like, I don't even, like, I would almost be like, what about Alice in Chains? Like, is that metal at all? Or is that. I, I think that that was probably at the time. Like, what it, about Kiss? Yeah. Or is that not considered metal at all even? I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't. I mean, at the time it was different and right. Different people of different ages are going to think different things because if you were there when it happened, like, right. And we probably have a way different perception of the black album than a lot of people did because the black album got a lot of backlash. Mm. Um, because people that actually liked Metallica and that liked Ride the Lightning and Master Puppets and Justice, you know, and then uh, what was the thing? I, it was for the Black Album. Wait, or maybe that was for the one afterwards, but the whole haircut thing, right? Mm. That people were 
mad that Metallica went cut their hair pop and cut their oh, hair. Oh, I didn't, didn't even know that. I've never even heard that. Yeah. See, I, when I think of James, I think of him with short hair. Yeah. Because that's sure. all he's ever had, is to my knowledge. I think the sign was friends don't let friends get friends haircuts. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> that's awesome. See, but it's so funny, too, because it's just like I feel like that this like thing we're talking about, like what we're talking about sort of is like the idea of a band selling out or whatever. Which has always been so interesting to me because as a person who I would say in general for me, I would I would vastly prefer all those albums that were the are the albums where the band sold out to the albums that came before that, mm -hmm. you know, and so it's really interesting to, to think about that stuff. And it's also fun to think about, like, almost every metal band gets less heavy as the guys get older. Yeah. Not necessarily true, but I feel like a lot of, and maybe that's not so true anymore now, but I feel like when I was getting into metal and I was getting into bands like Soil Work and In Flames and stuff like that, like you knew that the albums that they were putting out at that time sounded a particular way. And if you wanted to, you could go back and listen to the earlier albums, but it was basically a completely different band. It was just no clean vocals, extremely heavy, very fast very little synths or keyboards at all. Like I can remember being in high school and reading and I used to subscribe to metal edge magazine and I loved metal edge and I wish that I, they still were going and I would still subscribe to it. But I remember reading, you know, and that was a magazine that was run by people who were metal heads, like more old school metal guys. And I remember in every interview they would ask like bands, like children of bottom, like, do you really feel like the keyboards are necessary? And it's like, yes, they're necessary. It is it's like the coolest, first of all, it's the coolest part of Children of Bodom. It's the thing that makes them sound different from everything else. And also, like, it's an integral part of their band. But in every single interview, they would ask them, like, soil work. Like, are you sure you should have the keyboards in your music? And I distinctly remember there being a time where it was like, if you used keyboards or synths or samples in your music or production, stuff like that, that you were, like, less heavy than other bands. And I know that that's been a thing probably forever. Right. But, like... I can remember that being a thing when we, I was in high school and like even slightly before that, when I was like in um, junior high and stuff, when I was just starting to get into metal music, even at the time, me, myself reading in things and, and, and learning about metal music and stuff. I remember seeing backlash to bands being less heavy. So this idea that a band is sold out or that they're going pop or that they are trying to be more mainstream just seems like a thing that's always been. And it's funny because Metallica is like the biggest, biggest like metal band of all time. One of the biggest bands of all time. And it seems like they're like the poster child for like all of a sudden we're just going to make songs that everybody on the planet likes instead of this much more niche thing. Right. This like fast, intense thing. Yeah. And all of a sudden they just made stuff that everybody liked. And there was like the core of people that really loved Metallica before rebelled against them and that. Every band has, I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore, but just like, it's so fascinating to me, I guess. And so I'm excited to listen to Ride the Lightning, which is what this video is actually about. <laughs> I'm excited to listen to Ride the Lightning, but my expectations of it are going to probably be that I won't even like it that much, is kind of what I think. Now, I will say, like, I there is fast, I get, it's so funny, because like, I just don't think of Metallica as being like, heavy, ever. Like, I just don't think of them as like a heavy band. So I'm I'm going to be shocked if I listen to this and it's like sounds heavy at all. But am I going to perceive it as heavy? Because to me, what I perceive is like the heaviest music is like breakdowns and stuff. <laughs> and I don't expect any breakdowns in the middle of a seven minute long Metallica song from 1984. You know, now I also know that Metallica, which which album of theirs was one on? Was that on Master of Puppets? No, it was on Justice. Oh, no, that might be. I don't know. You might have to cut this. If I'm wrong, you're going to have to cut this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the only reason I ask that is because I think I have heard one. That is that is a Metallica song, right? Because I think, doesn't Korn have a song called One, Two? I don't know anything about Korn. I know I that. Think... <laughs> I know that one. <laughs> Well, they've got a lot of better songs than that. <laughs> but that is a Freak on a classic. But um, <laughs> That's what that song is called. Here, we can just look over here, too. I can just scroll up. We're right here. 
Oh no, I, um, we can still very easily look. Oh. But but the reason I asked that is because I have heard one, and when I heard it, I was like, "What is this? This is like a ballad," you know. And I, it's not that I. Oh, I guess. Yeah, not. I was right. It is. It's on justice. See, we're we're scrolling through Spotify at the moment. If I leave this in, and okay, yes. So Yay, Black and Injustice for All, Eye of the Beholder, One, The Short and Straw, Harvester of Sorrow, The oh. Frayed Ends of Sanity, To Live is to Die, and Dyer's Eve. The apparently. Justice is so good. Which is so weird because that's the one that has no bass, right? Yeah. But... How could an album with no bass sound good? You just have to. <laughs> Gotta to listen do. to it. That I'm, we're planning. I'm planning to get to that one. So, but so like I do know that Metallica. Like if 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 I had never heard one, I wouldn't expect there to be any moments like that on this, and I don't know if there will be, but like, like In Flames is one of my favorite metal bands, and they have a new album coming out later this week that I am so excited to do a reaction of, and I'll be doing that myself on my channel, like my normal videos. But like one of the things they'll do is they'll be going like a metal song, and then they'll just stop, and there'll be like an acoustic guitar section in the middle of a song. Does Metallica do that kind of stuff? Don't tell me. We'll see when I we mean, listen. I to haven't it. been telling you anything. I, want I know. To serve I know. That's surprise. why when I asked the question, I was like, "No, don't tell me." <laughs> but like, I don't know if I should expect that or not because I know at the time I think they were like much more focused on their like live performance. But I don't know if obviously like the black they they used strings and stuff on the black album, which is something they couldn't recreate live until they did their Symphony of Metallica thing. So like. I know that they're not the kind of band to go in the studio and like limit themselves to only doing what they can reproduce live. So like, and I, I think if I've read before that, like they, they're one of, they like enjoy going into the studio and like creating in the studio and they're not afraid to create stuff that can't be recreated live, I guess. So like, I don't know if that was the case this early on in their career. Like, so we're going to be listening to their second album, right? So I would assume following most bands, their first album was like, sounds awful and way different than anything else in their catalog, but might be some of the best songs they ever wrote because they're the songs they sat with the longest before they created their album. Then they released that album that I'm assuming, like I said, sounds like garbage. And then they get picked up by a record label or something. And then this is going to be their first like major label release. I don't know if I'm right in this or not at all. But I'm assuming this is like their first major label release. So like, did they just go into the studio over a weekend and record the entire album? And it's amazing because of their performances. Or did they go in the studio and over four months craft this amazing album that like they put all this time and effort into and all this crazy production techniques and things that they were creating in the 80s? You know, like, is it that kind of a thing? Or is it like revered because of how complex it is and how it's incredible that they did it in like the short amount of time that they did? like? I don't know about this and i'm obviously those aren't the only two ways they could have recorded the album but i mean it seems like those are the two really the like, like that's the thing that i would guess of one of those two things yeah. either they went in and did it real fast and it was like this amazingly uh easy process and they just happened to write these fantastic songs that people really still highly regard today and they did it really fast and it's amazing that it's as good as it is or they went in the studio and they spent a lot of time working on these songs and they had better be as good as they are because there was all that extra effort put into them does that make sense yeah so like i don't know what which of those two things this is if it is that or not i don't know what else it could be but like i'm expecting it to be one of those two things and I would vastly prefer an album that was like crafted over time with all these intricacies and details and things put into it. But I don't know. And like, I just don't know what to expect. I know I keep saying that and we should just finally get into listening to this stupid Let's thing. Let's do it. So, but before we do, we have to do one more thing. I always do in my videos. We'll be right back. In three, two, one. Okay. So before we get into actually listening to this, I just want to say I've been rambling for a long time. Let's all take a breath. Okay. Let's take a breath, relax, because I want to enjoy this album. <laughs> if you are if you watched all that, the, oh my God, we've been recording for 50 minutes. If you watched all of that, first of all, thank you for being here. I hope you have a good understanding of where I'm coming from, from this, and hopefully that was slightly entertaining to you. And I hope that everybody's sitting out there going like, oh, this idiot, he doesn't know what he's in for, you know? <laughs> I hope everyone's not sitting there going... Oh, this guy's going to hate this because I really don't want to hate this. I want to like this. And I want to I want to make sure that I say as well, like I am trying to temper my expectations for this, because when I think of 80s music, I think of 
it, it could sound awful, like production wise. Now, with that being said, we are going to listen to the remastered versions. But another thing I have to say, I got my Mountain Dew Major Melon here. The label's kind of covered by this thing, but it doesn't matter. Major Melon, which is watermelon flavored Mountain Dew, Chris. Huh. I know you care so much. I do. Oh, and in the bottom of my glass, I have some uh, Kool-Aid for my eyes. Oh, yeah, look at that. It's it's slushing. I had it in the freezer. So. A little ASMR there for everybody. <laughs> Get it all here. <laughs> if you put me in front of a microphone, eventually you will get it all. <laughs> I mean, I'll just talk forever until the dogs come I home. I think what Patrick was trying to say, if you listen to over 40 minutes of rambling, that you should probably hit subscribe and hit the little bell so well, you get notified when stuff comes out. Yes, for sure, definitely. If you listen to all of that, hit subscribe. No one is going to listen to all of that. <laughs> no one is, but... But the thing is, like, it's fun, and it was fun for me to get those thoughts out because we've never really talked about Metallica that much. No. You know, and you're the only person that I know of that really enjoys Metallica other than my other friend, Chris, who I was hoping to maybe do the 72 seasons reaction with. But we'll see. Um, you get first dibs on that if we can do. I don't know if we could do all three people together, but but anyway, we'll see what ends up happening. So this video is just for Ride the Lightning. And I'm going to take the Metallica CDs and put them back there. Nobody cares about them anyway. But all right. Without further ado. <clears throat> Now, I will say also, for if you're unfamiliar with my videos, I will probably talk over a vast majority of the music. That's what I tend to just do. Uh, and also, Chris and I both, one of the things we didn't mention was, Chris, one of the classes you teach is a critical listening class. Mm -hmm. Is that what you call it? Or Mixed listening, I think. Mixed listening. I like to call it critical listening because, I mean, that's basically what it is. And that's what I always tag all my videos is critical listening. Okay. That, I don't know if that I think sense, that your your headphones might uh, qualify for that. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just saying what we tend to listen to and focus on when we're talking about stuff is production. And that's for spe for me specifically. Now, that's why I was saying I might hate this album because I'm expecting the production to be 80s production. And I don't necessarily expect that to be good. Uh, so with that being said, just know I'm probably not going to sit here and dissect lyrics. I'm not going to probably have any personal meaning or messaging to any of this stuff. I don't even know if I'll pay attention to a single lyric. We'll see what happens. I don't know if I'll be able to understand it for as far as I know. It might just be drenched in reverb all over the place since it is 1984. But, um... So don't expect don't expect that and do expect us to talk about the production of things. Maybe I don't know. Like I said, if it if it is the case of that second case where I was talking about just a minute ago of them, like putting all this effort into it, I expect there to be more production techniques and tricks and things being used. If it was just them going into the studio and performing the album, basically the way you hear it, I hope that the mixing was done well. And I don't necessarily expect a lot of conversation to be had about the production. Maybe we'll talk more about the songwriting or the um you know, the song structuring, things like that, rather than production techniques or recording techniques, because I don't know how much we're going to be able to talk about. Plus, all that stuff was way before our time. So, okay, with that being said, finally, without further ado, 1980, from 1984, Metallica's Ride the Lightning. We're listening to the remastered version on Spotify. I will edit around ads, so don't worry about that. I will get some ads, but I'll just edit around it. Again, I will clearly have labeled on screen always what you're hearing uh, if I can't have the audio. So, all right, let's listen to this. First track, Fight Fire with Fire, four minutes, 44 seconds long. Okay, here we go. Okay, acoustic guitar. Shocked. I'm shocked. I guess I'm not shocked, but like. Like 12 string acoustic. Okay, yeah. So far, this could be an early heart album. So there's they're double tracking the acoustic guitar, right? With an, a lead acoustic guitar in the middle. Yep. Okay. Cymbal swell. So this is the first time you've heard the remastered version, I believe. Eh, maybe. Listen to it like this for sure. 
Now, I know Lars is also famous for his, like, stomping the symbol thing. And that's what was just <laughs> happening there. Okay, so this is just, like, fast. And then the, the drums are that sort of thrash beat. You know, it's not da 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 it's da 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 like it's... It's kind of what I was expecting. I mean, it sounds just like James Hetfield, which, I mean, makes sense. Okay, nice delay there at the end that of the That was phrase. a weird delay. Just, like, one note that he's hitting each time. Very, like, monosyllable, but I'm assuming that's, like, intentional. The guitar seems right heavy. Does that seem like that to you? The who? The guitar seems right side heavy. Like the mix. Oh. Yeah. Is it? Like, I don't even know if I hear guitar on the left at all. Oh, wait, sorry. My chord is reversing. So it would be left for you. Yeah. I think a lot of metal records seem like that. Yeah. I think, I think that James is on the left. Well, that makes sense then. Is he considered the lead guitar or is Kirk? Well, Kirk is the lead guitar. Like he, but Kirk does the solos. Yes. But not all of them. Not all of them. I don't know for sure, but I bet that that's James that plays the lead acoustic part on the intro. Okay. It doesn't sound bad. No, not at all. I mean, it's. I was it's expecting it to. I was expecting it to sound thin, but it does not. No. It doesn't sound thin. His voice definitely has that like. Is it, is it double track? Or that's is it what just, I was wondering. I'm going to pay attention to I, that. Now, the solo to me seems a little bit low in volume. Like, it could be up more. Yeah. Double bass. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> this is it's what like Metallica is. Soaring, har <laughs> soaring harmony guitar solos. And wide, right? Yeah. Yes. So with, the, so with rhythm guitar... Now is the guitar timed right, or it's like it's like dun 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 dun, dun, dun but it's not like I'm not saying it was wrong, but it felt a little loose, like the timing. That's now I don't know how me. old they were at this point, like like were they in their, in their, their young twenties? Yeah, probably. Dude, that it sounds so raw, like the guitar tone and stuff. Like, I mean, so much of the metal that I listen to is like so produced. And there's so many layers of things underneath everything that this is very stripped back compared to what I normally. But I mean, that's what's interesting to me about like these older metal records is because like I think they were still figuring out how to record it. Right, for sure. Because I mean, like there wasn't metal like this. I mean, five or six years before this, no one had thought about recording stuff. Like, right. As far as I know. Like, so like, how is this different from like Judas or uh, from like Iron Maiden? Then? This is heavy. Iron Maiden's not? Not really. Not, okay. not like this. And there's not double bass like that. Okay, and okay. not what you would say is double bass. And, and really, if you listen to what they did on that Lux Eterna song, that's pretty good bass, double bass playing for Lars -y. I thought Lux Eterna sounded fantastic production-wise. It had a nice warm tone to the entire thing, but it sounded like throwback almost, like... It sounded like it sounded like a like almost like a '70s rock band. Okay, this is Ride the Lightning. That riff rips. A har harmonized. Oh yeah. Guitar part. Now what is that? Is he hitting the floor tom there? Yeah. And then, because that seems to be like a the floor tom thing seemed to be. The so snare the, drum really sounds pretty good. Yeah. Very, yeah, it's not, like, there There definitely is, like, a reverb tone to everything that's very 80s, but it's not overly done, I don't feel. That was really, oh, that was cool. That's double tracked, right? Yeah, it is. I think so.
Now, does he do the thing where he, since he's playing and singing at the same time, do a lot of his like vocal melodies and rhythms? Are they the, along? The, oh, sometimes. Like that was just bah, bah, da, 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 like that was. And I only asked that, bring that up because that's something you and I have talked about before in the past. It definitely, it's either vocal, it's it's either like double tracked or there's like a chorus effect on it or something, but it's like a mono effect. Oh yeah, the vocals are dead in the center. I don't think we've heard a background vocal yet. But there was one a little bit ago. They, they did like, ah, some kind of a weird thing where it was multiple tracks. Okay. I think. That's another thing I know about him. He does that ha at the end of words. Words ah, right? Yes. That's like a James thing. <laughs> it's so funny listening to this because I have recorded your bands and it's just like, this could be like, not necessarily this, but like, this could be like a Primal Waters riff. Like, it's so clearly like Metallica, like, dang. So there's double bass again. Yeah. It sounds like garbage, but... It doesn't sound like garbage, but, but it doesn't sound like you expect double bass to sound, but you can tell it's there. Now, are most of these songs in standard tuning? Yeah, I think that most Metallica is. Okay. Because that was one thing I was going to say, like, so far, everything has felt very uniform in terms of like the dynamics of the guitars. There's a lot of modern metal. If someone's playing high, it's it's like smaller feeling than like the enormous, gigantic, like low crunchy stuff. And I don't know if that's because a lot of the stuff I listen to is detuned, you know, but I think it's also just like a lot of stuff is supplemented now with sub bass frequencies and all these things that get added in. Whereas this just sounds like a uniform sound across all the guitars and it doesn't get louder or quieter it's i don't want to say it's over compressed but it just sounds like like the guitars don't feel dynamic at all they're just it's just a single thread that never i don't know if am i am i explaining it right but like i can hear the like Whenever you palm mute a guitar, there's like a woofiness to it, yeah. and like I hear that, so that to me says that like the low to mid frequencies are being handled pretty good. And a lot, and when you're like mixing guitars, is sometimes hard because if you have a chugging palm muted part, that can have so much more low end than like if you're holding chords open or something, that it's hard. To... I mean, this is awesome. This is awesome. I should probably talk less and listen. More. I did not. I did not actually listen to this album yesterday. I was thinking about doing it, but oh, I yeah? chose not to. And I'm so glad I didn't, because I, of course, I've heard this all a thousand times, but right. I forgot how much I loved it. I mean, this is great. It's just fun. Like, it just feels fun to me. And I don't know, but like at the time, when people listen to this and be like, "There's never been anything like this," like. A Probably lot of for people. most people because they were so mainstream. Were they mainstream at this time? No, this is pretty, this no. is pretty early. I mean, Black Album was a big... No, I know, but I mean, like, <laughs> were they renowned, though? Like, all other heavy bands, all bands were like, oh, my God, we, we need... This is what we're going to do from now on, like... Yeah, I, don't, I don't really... I don't remember. I've read a bunch of Metallica stuff, but I don't remember when that thing was. I like this. A little half-tempo part there. This is almost a breakdown. Oh, now we get... That back to the tom, that farty sounding bass <laughs> too. It sounds good when it's like everything's going, but the bass I, does not sound that fantastic to me. But I'm just so used to modern bass where it's this all encompassing low frequency thing, and that's not what this. And is. so much automation, which like yeah. you can just tell that this there's not happen. much. Yeah. I mean. Feel free to comment and disagree, but I doubt that Metallica was ever really that great of a band. So I've seen Metallica a couple, a couple times, and I love Metallica, and they they suck live. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but like, so they had to Wait, spend. Wait, hold on. Time. Fade to Black is on this album. Yeah. Fade to Black sounds familiar to me. Why is that though? See, I wonder if it was used in wrestling. Because the funny thing about this is so stupid, but there's a uh, 
who was the other band that was with Metallica? Was it Megadeth? Yeah. Like the guy from Megadeth was in Metallica or some crap like that. There's an old Megadeth song called um, Seek and Destroy or something like that. No. Is that's, that Metallica? That's a Metallica song. Seek and Destroy? I know that song because that was part of a WCW compilation that I got. <laughs> but there's a, Metal- a Megadeth song. It's really cool. Well, anyway, okay, so that's. Sorry. I was thinking maybe Fate to Black was something like that, that like WWE used it for something at some point. But I might be thinking. Ooh, listen to that delay at the I end there. Back to Black by ACDC. <laughs> or Back in Black. <laughs> but I definitely know that song. Okay, so this is For Whom the Bell Tolls. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we have a, a sound effect, which is really cool right it away. Is. Obviously, if you're going to have uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls. You've heard this riff before, right? I've heard that part. God, this rips. Oh, man. So what is is that? So that sounds like it's doubled, but there's some kind of like a... Was that a whammy or something? Or not a whammy, a, a wah pedal? It almost sounds like an octave pedal or something, but they didn't have those at the time, did they? That might be the way that it's tracked in there. They didn't have octave pedals at this time, did they, or anything? Oh, like yeah, they had octave pedals since the 60s. Really? That okay. was, like, one of the first ones. Like, that was a Jimi Hendrix thing. Oh, octave okay, pedals. okay, okay. So this, I like this tempo. This is cool. Yeah. And like... I, I expect it to, like, double up here, probably, but... Oh! <laughs> that is... <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's cool. I'm trying to, like... Rem... I'm trying to... Like this, to, this part to me just seems like so, like so any band that I know what could do that kind of thing now. But I'm trying to think of like at the time, that's cool. Like I guess I, w- I want to try to get a feel for like how revolutionary this was. Like, did people buy this record and put it on their record player and like have their minds blown because they probably had never heard anything like that before, or wh- was it, or were they just like? I don't know, like, I'm sure that did happen to a lot of people. I'm sure. But, I don't know, I'm just trying to, I want to try to be able to appreciate it from that aspect as much as I can. The idea that, be, that, isn't that Don't Tread On Me? Da, 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 da. Don't Tread On it, Me! Oh, I don't guess it's, 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 sort of, it's sort of like that, okay. isn't it? So on this one, he is way more singing more. Like, there's much more of a melody here. But, like, straining the whole time, because he doesn't yes. sing like this anymore. Like, yes. it's, it's higher, for sure. Yeah. So do they do this live? Can he do it live? It sounds different. Yeah. But... Oh, you know what? The Undertaker. The WWE has done tributes to The Undertaker with this song. So that's why I've heard parts of this, for sure. I mean, plus I know, like, For Whom the Bell Tolls is like an iconic song in their catalog, and I just think in general. So I'm sure I've come across parts of it before. But it was seeming more familiar to me than I thought it would, and I think it's because WWE has used this song in Undertaker tributes. Because The Undertaker officially retired last year, and they did, like, a thousand video packages to it. And his thing was always coming out to the bell okay. and stuff like that. And so, and he was always like a very dark character. So, but the cool part about this song is this: all those stops in this song. The song's full of them. Okay, they're, they're okay. so cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Is Lars considered like a good drummer? No. Okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I was curious. I don't know. But like, all oh, this stuff is cool. Those yeah. skills are kind of grade school, but like, I, they're effective. I like them. And that's the thing I'm trying to like wrap my head around. Like, is it is it like simple, or is it just because it was so early on? Like that, you, if you're the first band to do something, you get a pass for doing it not perfectly you know what i mean yeah and a bunch of stuff was like this too because like and this is slower this song this song is slower so 
Was that a guitar? Or a... Yeah, that's a guitar. Really? Yeah. Let's make sure we're still recording. Oh, yeah. So, obviously, huge panning effect here. And I know it goes on forever, but this is one of my favorite parts of this song. And it fades out. It fades out, but the riff just goes on forever, right? And it's got that lopsided. See, time in this case, feel. that's kind of cool. I, again, it's not. I'm never going to excuse anyone fading something out, but like in this case, they played the song and then they did that this part, and then they just kind of looped it and faded it out. Yes. But it was a different part of the song. Like clearly, that's the outro of the song. Yes. So I can. It's not I'm, like the chorus. I'm more forgiving of that than it is if someone just yeah they get to the third chorus and just fade the song out. Okay, we get an ad. Okay, so I'm glad you, I thought you might hate it more than this. No, no, no. I, I just, I'm. It's hard for me to. I just don't know how impressed I'm supposed to be with it. Does that make sense as a question? Yeah, like, I, yeah. I don't know. It's just music. I know, but I've just heard like Metallica is like held to this like, like legendary like, and I don't, I don't know if the reason for that is just because they've been around forever. And they're respected or what. But like I also know people joke about Metallica a lot. But they're not really like a hated band. Like Nickelback or Korn yeah, right. or something like yes. that. So like obviously they're respected. And like it's I watched those Loudwire videos I mentioned where they're asking like what's the greatest riff of all time, right? Like half the people say Metallica riffs. And so it's like clearly they are like revered by like metal people. And so it's like... That's the thing I I don't like. Why sh why listening to it now? F you know, forty years later, twenty thirty eight years later, thirty nine years later. Like, does it deserve me? Like, like, like that's what I'm saying. I'm trying to like appreciate it for what it was at the time, but because I don't have any context for like what this was at the time it's hard for me to appreciate it from that angle yeah but it, you know I, mean, I mean in a way i don't think that that okay this is fade to black matters because like like some of that guitar shreddy harmony part stuff like i don't hear a lot of that in the modern metal that i listen to now and i really like that kind of stuff mm -hmm. okay more acoustic guitar here i love the acoustic guitar stuff yeah. And it's only been these two and songs here. And sounds great with the cheesy 80s reverb on it. Yeah, oh yeah. And a slightly out of tune lead guitar. <laughs> That's not something that would ever bother me, but you know that. <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. Like, this is cool. Yeah. I like the fact that they're t they're willing to take the time to do this kind of stuff. That's a so how how different this early how Metallica. different is this from Kill 'Em All then right that was their first album yeah um it's it's different I don't think that you could have made it I don't think you could have made it through Kill 'Em All okay now we're more twelve string this is this is so in flames that it's like disgusting to me. <laughs> but the funny thing about in flames is that they have this like Scandinavian feel to them that's not present here at all. But obviously Metallica's from the United States. Lars is Danish. Is he? Grew up in Daneland. Oh, actually, you know what? I did know that. I think. And I think that this album was recorded in Danish land. Okay, that's really interesting. The cool... It almost sounds like there's a piano That's in there. what I was just going to say. Is that a piano in there? I think it's no, just it's guitar. High, it's high notes on the guitar. Really cool, though, that we both thought that. Yeah. Because you can tell he's really playing the acoustic guitar hard. Like, he's he's playing it hard. Like, that could have been done really softly and then turned up, but I don't know if it would have worked as well.
another thing that probably would should be said too is like I don't really listen to metal that would be like this as much at all, you know? Because I know, like, we talk about our albums of the year every year a little bit. Yeah. And I still haven't listened to that Master Boot record. I was waiting to see if you liked doing this process so much that you would want to do it with me for that. Yeah. Because I, you say Master Boot, and I have, like, no clue what that band is at all. I have no clue what they sound like. But I know that you, like, you listen to a lot of metal that I don't listen to. Yeah. And I, probably stuff that I wouldn't necessarily like as much. Yeah. And the same could definitely be said for the stuff I listen to that you probably wouldn't like as much either. It really sounds like there's piano in there. <laughs> I think they're just really, I think they're really high, hard notes. Bing! On the, on the 12 string. But it does have that piano tone. That's Is it a 12 string, this too? Yeah. They don't play acoustic guitars live, do they? Yeah. They have... The stands. Okay, really? That's really cool. I love that. That's what I was going to say at the beginning of this song, that, like, the drums during the metal part like this, they feel like they're mixed in really well. But I feel like when the drums were playing with the acoustic guitars, they were, like, definitely brought back more. And I don't know if they were brought back in the mix or if Lars was just playing quieter. Oh. You know? Uh... Because this doesn't feel very dynamic to me. It's still, again, we're also listening to a remaster, and the only way to really remaster stuff like this is to compress it more and stuff, you know. So, and to EQ and whatnot. But, you know, I doubt they they didn't have the original tracks when they remastered it, or there would be a remix. <laughs> and now it's a totally different song. I mean, it's the same song, yeah. but, like... Yeah, that's the other thing. There haven't been lots of choruses or anything. For Whom the Bell Told... For Whom the Bell Told had a very distinct By vocal fire melody. Or fire? Yeah, I guess. I guess I wasn't paying attention to it as much. Trapped Under Ice totally has a chorus, too. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Right, here's a new... We haven't heard this riff yet, right? And here we are, five minutes in. Yeah. I'm glad that you understand so much better now all the music of mine I've made you record. Oh, a lot. (laughs) (laughs) And, like, barely... Right? Barely any background vocals. There's a lot of effects on the vocals, but, like, it's not like... I wouldn't call this, like, high vocal production. Well, the other thing, too, that I'm noticing is, like... Okay, so here, this guitar part is more of like a lead guitar part. Like the, the parts to the, the riff is like a lead riff. It's not just like a chunky rhythmic thing. It's, it is like a, there's like guitar harmonizing and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so some bands would do that with beds of guitars underneath it. You know what I mean? But this is just, you got one guitar on the left, one guitar on the right, bass in the middle of the drums. And when the, the guitars are not playing heavy stuff, the song isn't heavy. You know what I mean? Like, but a lot of bands would overdub underneath that. You know, we are we talked about that a lot when we were doing the Primal records. And I would always want you to have beds of just holding out chords and stuff underneath parts like that. And sometimes you just didn't want to or whatever, and it depended on the riff. But then, over the top of that, this guitar solo came in. So there was like a third guitar lead part, kind of. So that's just an interesting thing to keep in mind as well. Because, like, that's one of the things I like about a lot of the metal bands I like is, like, the layering of stuff. So, like, in Flames, they do harmonized guitar stuff all the time. And they always have that sitting on top of a bed of guitars, whether it's a chunky rhythmic riff or just holding out chords or something. Okay. Now, I will say, I understand that, like, pretty much 90% of music before 1999 was all faded out because everyone was a lazy songwriter and stupid idiot cowards. But well, I have... Was that for... Ra- I mean, I mean, this wasn't, but were some of that for radio play? So over the top, they'd be like, and welcome back to 98.7. No, it was just literally to fit... Well, first of all, you if, if any of the songs were going to be a single, you could only fit so much on a 45. So songs would be faded out on every 45. It's just faded out, whatever. That's why they have radio edits, so they could fit it on a single. Yeah. But like... I understand that so much music was just faded out. Like, 
everything in the 60s, everything in the 70s was faded out. Like every record, every vinyl record that I have, pretty much every song fades out. And it absolutely kills me. And it's why I can't listen to so much stuff that's like classic music. It's so that's what, the, that's what the... Um, the pedal, right? The wah pedal? Oh, yeah. So much of my understanding of guitar comes from recording and your brother, you know? So it's like, that's my... That's how I approach things sometimes. It's like... There we have that some shouty vocals. Yeah, that was one thing I was curious to see. Because, like, Children of Bodom are famous for having their shouty gang vocals. I was wondering if Metallica ever did that or not, either. And I thought maybe they would do it a lot more in their earlier stuff. So is this considered their more, like, thrashy stuff? Yeah. And it's... See, now, here's the double bass. Yeah, it's a thrash riff, right? Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Did they even say thrash in 1984, though? I don't know if they did or not. That's a good question. I think I that know. some of it, I think that sometimes this is just like, if I'm wrong, I'll feel very dumb. But I think that people call this kind of stuff speed metal sometimes. Well, I was going to ask what the, I was honestly going to ask you if you knew what the difference between speed metal and thrash metal was. Because the only thing I know about speed metal is like Soilwork's first two albums are considered more speed metal than anything else. Yeah. And they did not they did not sound thrashy really at all. And to me the to me the difference in a lot of metal genres is literally just the drum patterns. Yeah. Like the guitars can be fast and whatever, but the drums and how the drums work is a lot of it. Like this is cool, but there, if there's more of like a gallopy feel to it, then that's different than than like like I don't know. But then there's also like power metal, which to me is something that definitely is like this kind of stuff, but with more high pitched vocals. Like to me, like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden would be more like power metal. Yeah. But power metal is also associated with like folk metal and stuff, and it's closer to like prog metal as well. It's mostly like clean vocals and stuff, and almost all power metal is about like battles and dragons and stuff. But like modern power metal bands like Sabaton and stuff are completely different, but they're bassist in that. But power metal's super fast as well. That's the thing I think of with that. So that's what I think of like this too. But with the guitar, the guitar riff, like the, yeah, because I'm not a guitar player really, it's hard to know, but like having like the, the, the core of the riff be like the root or whatever, and everything is like diddling around and then coming back to the da 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 whatever, like whatever it's a triplet or whatever. Yeah. So it's like you always have the open string as the like the thing you're coming back to, and then it's just what you're moving around to. But then there's other stuff that where you're moving more on the guitar for like you're not going back to that. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. This is that like like you the guitar you play, I would say. Like a lot of the time. Like having the open string and like the the triplets or whatever, and then doing moving your fingers around the guitar, but always having a majority of the riff be like a rhythmic pattern on the like key, the root key of the whatever. Yeah, I'm sure that every song on this record is an E. Right, and so like I don't think we've heard a key. Ch- I, don't, I don't think so, but sorry, we probably just talked over that entire thing. None of that sounded familiar to me at all. Oh, so you because that was one of the ones you were saying like. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm shocked. I think the drums sound great, really. Yeah, I for mean, what they are, you know, like not by modern the to- standards. The toms but... sound really good. The mixing is really good. Like, I, I think the vocals could be a little bit higher. Well. I don't know. With metal, it's really tough because there's a lot of metal where the vocals are just slightly like, like if you have the perfect volume, they're just slightly under that. And I feel like that's okay and acceptable in a lot of metal music. But also, I think a lot of the reasons for that is because the person who is doing the vocals does, isn't good. And they don't want to hear themselves, you know, so they just, they, they probably play the guitar. But... So that's cool. He's doing a vocal thing, and there the vo- the guitar is doing the harmony with him or whatever. 
I mean, this sounds like M Molly Crew or something, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's a... So Which I don't know any Molly Crew really at all, but... This is really cool. I yeah. like this. Yeah. I like the guitar playing with him doing the vocal part. That's cool. Now, I wasn't paying attention. Was that him playing that on the guitar and there was still a guitar riff going underneath that? Or was that a guitar lead, like a third guitar part over it? I hopefully they repeat that part. That sounded like the chorus to me, so hopefully they repeat that part. I wish I knew more bands from the time. I guess maybe that's maybe that's the core of all of this. Like, I just don't know heavy music from the 80s at all. So, like, I wish I could listen to this and be like... This might be my favorite thing I've heard. I... Okay. And you probably that, hate that. That's not, that's not the... I'm not surprised at all. And it's not that I don't enjoy the heavy stuff. But that's just catchy as crap. That's just part of the riff. I think you're right. There's some double tracking going on and stuff, but that's just part of the riff. A bell is back. Yeah. That's Different cool. bell than in yeah. German bell tolls. Now at the time, do you think they went and actually recorded a bell? I have no idea. Because this would have been really right around the time that Depeche Mode was in Germany recording Construction Time Again, which was known for their samples of recording in the studio. Like, that was when they would, like, put, put, put microphones out in the hallways and they'd go perform out in the hallway or go to a remote location and, and perform something there and bring it back to the studio and manipulate the stuff. And at the time, that was considered, like, crazy use of samples and things. Man, that farty bass. Anytime I hear the bass, it's not really like in a good way. There, I mean, there it were, doesn't sound bad. No, but like, you probably wouldn't do that like this now. That's cool. The uh, air raid siren. And that is what that is. It is. So what I'm getting from this is that they basically play half a song and then they just play different guitar riffs until the song is over. That's sort of what it is, yeah. Well, I don't know if I care for that. Like, I wish, I don't like, I don't, this is gonna fade out really egregiously. I, I, I don't mind the fact that they're doing that, like switching it up and here comes a different riff and repeating it and playing with it. But like, I just wish they would go back. Like, I feel like a song should always finish on something that you heard before so that it feels like this amazing resolution. Like you're coming back home to something that you know, and then yeah. when you leave, and I've talked about that on my channel so many times, and I understand the artist's intent with like having. Okay, this is an ad, but Creeping Death is coming up though, and I'm really looking forward to that one because people were mentioning that I believe in the heaviest guitar riff video that I watched for Loudwire. I really recommend checking those out, those okay. videos. The uh, I watched a couple of them and so it just YouTube recommends them to me, but they'll recommend them to me. And every time it's always a really interesting question that they ask the bands. And a lot of them are the same bands because it's just they asked like they were like I said, they went to a festival and they'll just ask like a band like 10 questions or whatever. And then so that they got 10 videos that they can do with all these different bands. But and it's funny, the it's fun, the bands they have on there, too, because they have like Guar, um, uh, dudes that are like hardcore metal. But then they have like. Um, the the lady that sing uh Courtney Laplante from Spirit Box or like much more modern bands or uh Tetrarch and like different different genres of metal from all over the place, yeah. including some like more electronicy things that still play at these metal festivals. Uh, so it's really interesting to hear everybody's different perspective on those things. Um, but Creeping Death was mentioned a bunch in one of those videos, and maybe it was just the same band and one guy really liked it, and then they were like, "Yeah, that is a good one." But the mere fact that someone mentioned that is interesting to me. I, I, I don't know if I like the idea of just like, I don't know. I feel like there's a lot of really cool ideas and I'm just not necessarily super happy with the way they're being put together. Okay, this is Creeping Death. Six and a half minutes long.
I will say the cymbals sound pretty good too. Yeah. Just in terms of overall. There you can hear the stereo reverb, right? If there was a little bit of that riff on the left side, yeah, but yeah. just the stereo. There is definitely something about this that's raw. And I say raw, I mean like, there's like a simple, simplified in terms of like the recording aspect of it. Cause like nowadays so much of this stuff would be so put through filters and all these things. And there'd be so many more layers. And this seems very simple. Like they just, one guitar on the left, one guitar on the right, bass, drums, and vocals. You know, not, and then it probably didn't do a ton of post-processing to this. And like, wow, less editing for sure. For sure. And so it's, I, I actually like, that's probably the thing I feel like I can appreciate the most about it. Like I, I appreciate the like looseness to it. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Like, Cause you would not make an album like this today unless you were trying to be like throwback. You know what I mean? No metal band would go into the studio and try to make something that sounded like this unless they were trying to sound like old school thrash or whatever. Right. And so that's interesting to think that at the time, this is probably the best that they could do, maybe. Yeah. I, so that's I, a good way maybe to, to explain it, to like appreciate it from that angle. I was going to ask you, I was curious, when you see like, and I don't know if, it's, if Creeping Death's like an important song in their catalog or whatever. I know that I was saying that they were mentioned, but like when you were like, okay, Creeping Death's the next song, do you know it well enough to be like, okay, here's what that song, you, you know the song well enough some to of, know? Some of them. And then, like I said, I haven't, like, probably sat and, like, concentrated while listening to Metallica for, I don't know, right. uh, since we were in college. But, like, I knew all this way better than I was scared that I might. Okay, okay. <laughs> I was worried that I was going to feel like Like, a knowing that the Call of Cthulhu or whatever is next, can you think of the riffs and stuff from that song? Not right now, because I'm listening to this song. Right, right, right. I just was curious. <laughs> I didn't know. Because I know you said, like, you have some of them, and like, I've been in bands that have played a bunch of Metallica songs too, or learned them for other reasons, or whatever. Sure. Like, so those ones are very familiar. I'm really curious to see. How's that done? Was he just... Oh, maybe I... Yeah, I was all played. Huh? I was just all played. No, I know that, but like, uh, it was a weird thing. Like a slidey thing there or something. But. So, here's something else. I mean, I mean, like, scale of 1 to 10. 1 being super easy, 10 being super hard. How hard is that guitar solo? Or what we're listening to? I don't know. I'm not as much of a lead guitar player as I should be. And oh, But re disregarding your, like... Would it's that pretty, be considered pretty, like a hard guitar solo? It depends on who we are. A lot of Kirk Hammett stuff is just blazing fast blues riffs, which is like what half or 75% of that solo okay, is. It just okay. blues riffs played really, really fast, or blues licks rather. That's cool. Yeah. That's awesome. I really don't know what to think of his vocals because I think I was kind of anticipating not liking them and the fact that they're not bothering me I think is probably it says a lot of the fact that it's it's like better it's I wasn't thinking it was going to be terrible but like I don't know like the fact that I'm not thinking about them as much yeah, I think I'm, it's a good thing I think so too I think you're doing very well I didn't know that you were going to be able to stand this oh wow but you have to take into consideration how old it is. Like, you have to do that. Oh, yeah. If you just show me this and you said this was recorded last week, I'd be like, this is garbage. But you have to take into consideration yeah. when it was recorded. And the amount of money that they probably had, which wasn't a lot, I'm sure. And the fact that they were so young. Like, there's a lot of factors that go into it. 
Yeah. But also, the like, first thing that I would have considered real background vocals, I think we've heard the whole time. Was I wasn't even listening to it. Was it pitch shifted? I, I don't know. Yeah, and I mean, I can't separate myself from that because of like from the thousand times I've heard these songs. Right. Like there's nostalgic feeling and it's you can't separate yourself from No, that. it's impossible, for sure. That's one another uh, one of the other reasons I think it's it's like I have a cool unique opportunity to listen to these albums for the first time and share my thoughts because like I don't have I have zero nostalgia. Yeah. You know what I mean? That was just up and down the scale, right? Okay, last track, Call of No, no Fade Out. Cthulhu. Yeah, no, I was going to say I like that song for that reason <laughs> only. Okay, we got a little... Wind sound effects there. Okay, so this is electric guitar, right? Yeah. I was really curious if they were going to have parts like this because whenever I listen to like Enter Sandman or or Nothing Else Matters or something like that I feel like their like clean electric guitar tone is so like uninteresting but because of what they're playing is so cool that like it because it's it's a really just like clean electric guitar sound with no quality to it whatsoever especially on the Black Album this one's got that phaser. Yeah, this uh, this has a little bit more to it, on. but it is still just like pretty ba bare bones. But like what's being played is really interesting. And so I was expecting to hear more of this kind of thing, but there really hasn't been as much as I thought. That's not that's fart bass. awesome. That's cool. <laughs> that's not what fart bass. No, he's actually using his finger or whatever. <laughs> This is cool. I yeah. like this a lot. This is very In Flames. And I know I keep saying that, but In Flames is one of the few bands I listen to that has lots of leads. What is that? Guitar noise. I don't think I've ever noticed that before. It's pretty cool. It is cool. And see, this is such a high guitar riff, like it feels like there should be some chunky stuff underneath it, you know? But that's not what this is. No. And that's kind of what I meant with it being like kind of simplified, even though I know it's not simple, it's technical. But like just the way it was recorded. Yeah. The layering or the lack of layering. Is this an instrumental song? Yeah. Really? Okay. I mean, we're two minutes into it, so I thought, but you can't, I can't tell. <laughs> what is that? It's so it's, weird. It's some whammy bar thing. It only comes in and out. It's a whammy bar and wah pedal thing. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. I was gonna say I'm really curious when I hear Master of Puppets if it's gonna sound like noticeably better. Yeah. I'm really curious about that. And the, and ever the fact that everybody you you and Chris Parker both sort of like insinuated that uh, and Justice for All is like way better than these two albums. Kind I don't of. think about way. I don't know about way better. I mean I think that 
Master Puppets is probably my favorite one, or it's the one I'm most emotionally attached to. Yeah. Um, but I really like Justice, and there was a while there where I would have told you that I thought that Justice was the best one. Okay. I'm just, I'm just so curious, like, how they're going to sound different from one another, I guess. Even if they even do sound much different, I don't know. Now, I will also ask, like, some guitar players are, like, they have, like, their guitar rig that becomes, like, famous with their, like, guitar tone and stuff. Yeah. Like, is Metallica like that? Like, does everyone buy the same exact gear that, like, Kirk Hammett uses? And No, I mean, I guess there's there's guitars from both of those guys that are... Like their uh, signature guitar or whatever. Yeah, they've changed brands some and stuff, but there's, like, a couple that were iconic, like, uh, I'm sure James is playing that iconic... Uh, Flying V on this record that was a big deal, and there was a couple throughout the years, and I remember ones that like when I was growing up that were a big deal, and you'd go buy the replicas and whatever. Sure. Um, but as far as amps and stuff go, and like guitar tone, like you know, some people are just iconic. Like some guitar players are so iconic, and they're like synonymous with their guitar sound. But this to me seems like I've heard this kind of guitar sound all over. So like, I don't know if that's just because they were doing something that was a little bit more, not generic, but like standard. And then it became the standard after that. Or I think the thing, I think the thing with Metallica is that James, you know, like you will go find many people on the internet who will say that James is the best rhythm guitar player ever. And so there's some, some of that. And then the way that Kirk plays solos is also, like, I guess sort of unique, or it was at the time, or whatever, okay. but like, the sound stuff, not really, because you're right, there are a lot of guitar players that are very associated with gear, and I don't... I'm pretty into guitar gear, and I don't have... I don't think that that's true about okay. Kirk that's and James. Good. Yeah. I mean, that almost makes me like him a little bit more. <laughs> Yeah, right. You know, just like whatever. But I'm sure at the time they were excited with the sounds they were getting, you know, and I don't know how different it was from anything else. But if there weren't other bands that were really playing a lot of... I, I'm I kind of want to save some of my thoughts for afterwards. But like, I am shocked with the amount of, like, fast, thrashy stuff to not. Yeah. Because I thought it was going to be way more that. I know. And so I'm really <laughs> shocked. But that also makes me think, like, I could absolutely see the band that wrote this album writing the Black Album. Yeah. Like, I didn't think I was going to feel that. I thought, we'll talk more about that afterwards. This is boring and way too long. Yeah. I'm just not one for the guitar stuff like this. Like, to me, it seems like they're focusing, their focus is on, like, more on, like, the riff and less on, like, I don't know. Maybe that's not the right way to say it, but, like, I'll save... We'll, we'll talk about, about that more overall in the overall thoughts. Like, this is cool, but they didn't need to repeat it again. Like, they did it twice. Now they're doing it like this is like the fourth time, and so now a lead guitar is coming over the top of it. And that seems to be what a lot of it is. Like, find a cool riff, repeat it several times, lead over the top of it, and then either move to another guitar riff, or this is probably going to start fading out now and be a two minute long fade out. <laughs> but, and again, I understand the time that was the normal, but like, you didn't have to do that Metallica. Also, I just want to say shout out to the fact that they have like a really cool logo and they've kept the logo their entire career. Yes, I... That is so awesome. I think that that's a pretty big metal thing. Yeah, oh, for sure. And it probably started with, you know, Metallica and Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and right that yeah. like yes, it's not yeah. all band but like all not all genres of music are like that. No. They not change at all. their logo like with every now album. album that comes out. Yes. And uh uh I don't like that. Like Oh. oh. 
do you think they did something different to his drum there to have that tom build up? I guess, like, or is that just a completely different instrument? I wonder. It sound like any of the other tom fills on the whole other on the whole rest of the record. This is great. I love this. Like, like a band live would do this to end a song. You know. Yes. Wow. Okay. Well, that is ride the lightning for the very first time. <laughs> and okay. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Headphones off. That. Okay. First thing I have to say is I know because this is Metallica, even though I talked for an hour before we got into this, I'm pretty sure that there will maybe be a little bit more people that end up watching this video on my channel than a lot of my other videos because Metallica is so big and so important. So I just want to say, first of all, please don't be so mad at me for talking over the music the entire time. Like that is just the way that I, that we do this around here. So like, you know, just, I, I can imagine a lot of people being really mad that the fact that I didn't like soak in every, every single note that Kirk played in every solo. But like, I don't know if you watched it, you could hear what we were talking about. And so I guess hashtag not sorry about that. But at the same time, like I understand, I definitely didn't like appreciate every aspect of that. But I do think that I was able to, you know, get what I got out of it. And you heard what I got out of it because we talked about it the whole time. So I just want to say that. Um, yeah, that was in some ways exactly what I thought it was going to be. But in a lot of ways, not what I thought it was going to be at all. You know, we were talking about it a little bit there during that last song and the the ratio of like much more melodic, slower stuff to the fast thrashy stuff was way different than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I thought it was going to be a lot more fast um, thrashy stuff than it was. There were several songs. I'm going to pull up the track listing on my phone just so that I have it uh, to look at. Because I think I might want to reference certain songs if I can separate them in my head. But so so I will say in listening to that, what I perceive as heavy music, mm. none of that was heavy at all to me. OK, because it wasn't it wasn't mixed heavy and it didn't sound heavy. Now, from the perspective of like, I understand a guitar riff, like one guitar riff is heavy another guitar riff is not heavy. Like there was heavy guitar riffs being played there. And I definitely can appreciate the fact that they were playing technical things. And like we were saying, it's hard for me because I don't know all like the verbiage of the guitar stuff, but like a lot of them were the kind of guitar riffs that I would associate with you playing in your band and stuff. Uh -huh. And having recorded that and mixed that and edited that, like I understand that kind of stuff on like a fundamental level, maybe more than the average person who doesn't know anything about metal would like, I understand that those are like heavy riffs, but nothing in that production ever at any point said, this is heavy music to me. Yeah. It was very non-dynamic. It was very, I'm not saying it was over compressed at all because I do not think it was over compressed, no, I don't think it was either. but it was very like, like I said, the guitar, just there was no dynamics in the guitar whatsoever with the possible exception of the acoustic guitar, which I do feel felt like I mentioned in one of the parts where it would have been really interesting had the, whoever was playing the guitar at the time, whether it was Kirk or James, had they played the guitar part quietly and then just turned it up in the mix. I probably would have personally preferred the way that would have made the acoustic guitar sound. But a lot of the acoustic guitar was like them bashing on the acoustic guitar like they're playing broken chords and arpeggiated stuff and whatnot and it was really cool but it seemed like they were like plucking very hard at every string and when i think of acoustic guitar that's not what i think of like i would like it to be softer and then i don't necessarily you know play it soft then turn it up you know that's what the way i would do it but hold on let me search for Madonna real quick so Fight Fire with Fire was like a one of the fast songs, just like straight up like a was with that like a thrash the, song the whole with time. With the acoustic intro. Intra acoustic intro, right. But was that like more of an intro to the song or an intro to the album? Well, I think that we'll have to listen to the next record to find out what we Okay, that's about kind that. of an, kind of an interesting thing to think of. <laughs> Ride the Lightning was also fast. Mm -hmm. Uh but then we got For Whom the Bell Tolls, which was straight up like that song could have been on the Black album. Yeah, I thought mid tempo, like very mid tempo, but also just like much more mel melody in the vocals. That song's heavy. It's he yes, yes, yeah, yeah. But again, it wasn't mixed heavy. No. 
So I guess that's what I'm saying. Like, I understand that the riff is heavy and I understand what they maybe for the time what they were doing was heavy. But like with my the way I listen to music and all the music I've listened, like the the softest corn song is way heavier than the, the way that was mixed. Maybe the production. Yeah, the production. And that's what I'm talking about. Like, I understand. And but I they say. They didn't even invent I, what was below 60 I say, hertz until 1990. I say corn intentionally. Like, I understand that people who like Metallica probably hate corn. And that's fine. I don't even like corn that much. But, like, we're talking about, like, two of the hugest bands of all time. And, like, corn is just. It, again, it was 15 years after this. You know, well, it was less than that because the first corn album was like 1993 or whatever, whatever. Okay. Right. But like the big, when corn got huge, it was when they started adding like hip hop stuff in like 1996, 1997. Yeah. So like that's 10 plus years after this mm-hmm. with way more digital recording. Mm-hmm. You know, because I, was this recorded to digital? No. It, it was, couldn't have been. Well, it's 1984. So it would have been right around the time when digital stuff was starting. I'm willing digital. to bet. You but probably comment below. <laughs> yeah, it probably wasn't. Now, one other thing I will say in looking at the track listing on here. So one thing I always fail to take into consideration is the fact that how the songs were put on the vinyl. Right. Because the, the last song on each side is always a little bit more like there's like a halfway point to vinyl records that don't occur in like a CD or one, the way we were listening to it. Right. Mm. So Fade to Black was the final track on the first side. Mm-hmm. And then that Trapped Under Ice was the first track of the next side. Yeah. And so knowing that, it's kind of interesting because Fade to Black was one of the songs that had that long outro, if I remember correctly, I think, and I where it out. like repeated and just kept going and then probably faded out because they're lazy songwriters. But then Trapped Under Ice was boom, right into it. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the heavier ones, I think, one of the faster, mm-hmm. more consistently fast. So, um, And starts out with a guitar solo. Right. And so having that start side two yeah. is really cool is really to cool. think of. And the fact that Fade to Black was the end of track of side one is, is interesting, too. Um, so this uh, it doesn't tell me the. OK, no, I was wondering if it told me the length of each side, because I was curious. I think they're both probably about the same, but it doesn't matter. But um, so. With listening to it the way we listen to it, it's kind of hard for me to separate all the songs. However, I will say that almost all of the songs felt like it was like the first half of a song. And then the second half was kind of just like, let's play some different riffs. And then the song's over. Like the first half of the song of all the songs had like way more vocals Mm -hmm. and there was more structuring to them maybe a repeated part for like a chorus or something. And then when it gets to the bridge where a song would typically have the bridge, they just go to like a, maybe a different sort of sounding riff for the song. They repeat it a bunch, maybe do a solo over the top of it. Then the riff changes, repeat it a few times, do a solo over the top of that. And then the song fades out. Mm -hmm. And that kind of seemed to be the structuring of a lot of the stuff. So on one hand, I don't know if I care for that because that's, I just had to like change my perception of what they're going for because they're not going clearly not going for like typical song structuring, which is probably one of the reasons people like it so much because most people, especially most like music people, they despise typical song structuring, ABA song structuring, Mm. the stuff that I like. Most people like they hate that, especially music people or metalheads. You know, they don't want anything to be typical. They want it to be, I don't know what people want. If they'd want that, just listen to prog music. Cause that's all prog music is. Is just no, there's no repeating parts whatsoever, but uh, some of it is, I don't want to, gen- you know, I, the, I just listen. Right, there are hooks and right. choruses. I, and- but if it doesn't repeat, it isn't a chorus. So it, that doesn't matter. But like, I just listened to the Riverside album that came out last week. And I don't think that there was any sections of those songs that really repeated that much. However, when you're when you spend twice the length on a section of a song, I feel like that's kind of because one of the reasons that I like structuring so much in songs is like if I like a part of the song, I want that part of the song to come back. But if you're going to have a part, a struck a section of a song that in a pop song would only be a certain length. But in a song like this, you double the length of that part. Mm. Then you're getting like if it's all in in one go, you're getting like a part that's twice as long, can be more intricate, can be added to, changed to the second time it comes back around. Mm-hmm. 
and then going to something else, the songs feel more segmented in terms of like, there's this part of the song, then there's this part of the song, then there's the outro of the song. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Rather than there being like, there's this part, then it goes into this part, then it goes back into that other part, then there's a whole different thing, and then it goes back into that other part, which I know I'm just like, it's all just sections of a song. But if you think of it more that way, more like, like that's one of the reasons that Infected Mushroom is such an important band to me because they have a lot of songs that don't have any choruses. And a lot of their songs are just instrumental. And since they're electronic, like trance music, a lot of the point of their music is you just start something and then you add something to it every every four bars. You add to it and it builds to the point where you can't fit any more in it. And then that's the release of tension, the, whether it's like a drop or the culmination of something coming together. And then you have the, the climax of the song and it, it's the release, like it's the building of the tension and the release. Whereas in this, a lot of metal is like that too, where you build the tension and then you release. This didn't really have that. This was pretty much more straightforward. And it was much more like, let's have a cool guitar riff with some singing over it. And then a different cool guitar riff and then a different good guitar riff with singing over it. And then guitar, riff, guitar, riff, guitar, riff, and then fade the song out, <laughs> which is fine. Like clearly this is like guitar driven music. Mm -hmm. Like, and we were talking when we were listening, we didn't hear anything on the record whatsoever in terms of, and there was no other instruments other than guitar, bass, drums, vocals, other than like the two songs that had a bell and the wind sound. Well, there was like a sound, there was a few sound effects. Yes. There were a few sound effects and um, there was the acoustic guitar, which I really enjoyed that. But there was really only one or two songs at most, I think, that used like the clean electric guitar tone that I think that Metallica was much more known for, especially on like Black Album. Like Black Album is full of the clean electric guitar tone. And we were just talking about that during one of these last songs that I feel like it's a very generic sounding electric guitar tone. Like it's like there's no character to the tone of the guitar at all really and i think the same could almost be said for the for the chunky guitars as well like the heavy guitars it's a very unassuming heavy guitar sound you know yeah. but how much of that is due to the fact that this was recorded when it was in 1984 when there wasn't all these different like like nowadays you can listen to like you can listen to mastodon and it sounds sonically completely different from you know whatever uh, any pick any other heavy metal like you know, 72 Seasons is going to sound sonically completely different from whatever the newest Korn album is. And maybe that's not a good example. Like, I'm trying to think. Like, you could have... I feel like nowadays it's a lot more common to have a record that's just guitar, bass, drums, vocals and have it sound, like, vastly different than another record that's just guitar, bass, drums, vocals. Mm. Whereas in 1990, 1985 or 1984, did all albums that were guitar, bass, drums, vocals... With distorted guitar like this, all just basically sound sonically the same because yeah. there wasn't as many different like techniques and different kind of guitar amps and stuff. I don't know. I'm sure there were tons of guitar amps and things like you could do, but like, yeah, I, I, do you know what I mean? Like, I do. does it if if Iron Maiden went into the studio and played the exact same thing Metallica did, would it sound the same? No. And I'm not talking about their style. I'm talking about like their gear and stuff. Yeah, no. No, it would sound different. Yeah, and actually, I I think that, I mean, <clears throat> maybe it was just listening. Uh, we're not going to go back and listen now, but I think that that there were some of the guitars earlier in the record on Ride the Lightning were more just like really really crunchy, mm -hmm. and then by the end of it, I forget what songs I'm thinking of now. Um, but there were some that were like more distorted. Like it wasn't like night and day difference, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but also. Yeah, there there was less um there were less choices about where to get that sort of super heavy distortion from and now there's a bajillion. Right. And also now like I don't think that there's probably any metal records that come out now where all of the guitar tones are real. Like Right. Everything's right? You can just sit and there stuff. and just click through the presets until you find right. stuff that you right. like. And right there's not um there's not all the Right, like the the super layering, like right, like you're coming at that. You mentioned that during while we were talking too. That if the guitars are playing high in the modern music production, if you are making a record that's guitar, bass, drums, and vocals, that if the guitars are both playing high, 
then, you know, the no brainer thing to do is to go figure out what rhythm that they can play and just go chunk, 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 chunk underneath, right, underneath the, the high part. Right. Yeah. And right. there's not really much of that in this. And also no. right with the automation and everything else, too, because like you wouldn't have had it some of those bass tones right sound weird now because you wouldn't do that you would have just reamped the bass to sound better in that part of the song and right it- exactly right and and it's it's funny too when i think about it like you can approach things differently now from like it's this is going to sound stupid probably but like now you can make a record now that sounds throwback you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you can intentionally make an album now that sounds like it was recorded in like the seventies or the eighties or the nineties or even further back, you know? Yeah. Whereas like in the eighties, you were just trying to make something that sounded like what you, the best you could make it at the time. Well, if does that were, make sense? If you were doing this thing. Yeah. I mean, I think that you'd feel different. I mean, I'm not necessarily we making like a to... point or anything there, but it's just like, I had never thought of it that way. Like yeah. nowadays you could, you know, you could go record the exact same album that I could record and they would sound completely different afterwards. And there's more to it than just like it's two different people working on it. Like, I don't I don't even know. There yeah. are more choices, but also, right, like uh, intent in night. So if this was 1984 in 1978, I don't know that anybody had thought about doing recordings like this and right. when you go even to more extreme metal like i think that that becomes more clear like um i'm thinking about death records a lot the band death mm-hmm. um which i just learned about them like a couple weeks ago and i, I didn't even know I'm there was a band pretty sure death. that you can't listen to that i don't <laughs> yeah. think that you'll make it but and right like i'm not going to pretend like they sound really good because they don't right but that was even from about the same time and even more extreme music mm. and like i just don't think that people knew how to record it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Be, right that it's like sense, all that though. it's like all that reverb like the whole thing is drenched in reverb if you're going to make a thrash record today unless you're trying to make it sound like it was in 1984 you you wouldn't put that much reverb on no not at all no and there'd be there'd be more vocal and that's just a sign that. of the times too because like the eighties were definitely the, the style. What happened with to music in the eighties was directly a result of what music was like in the seventies. You know, in the seventies, everything was close miked and, and dry. The exactly way Cleet liked all of his music, close miked and dry. Well, we're, and we're being, I'm ge- talking we're general. generally, yeah, I'm talking general. Here. Like I'm thinking like Fleetwood Mac. When I think of like seventies, I think like Fleetwood Mac, which I obviously is not what we're talking about. But like when I think of eighties, I think of like flock of seagulls or, Stevie Nicks or something, which is Fleetwood Mac, but Stevie Nicks, like Stevie Nicks career solo music from the 80s sounds vastly different sonically than Fleetwood Mac, right? Yeah. Fleetwood Mac is like close mic, little tingy sounding hi-hats. But Stevie Nicks in the 80s is like rock goddess, like reverb everywhere, rock anthem songs, right? Yes. And obviously there's like different styles of music going on there. But like in the 80s, so much was about reverb. It was about drums with that crazy 80s like gated reverb on it. But then also it was like there was like a backlash to like the the disco-y close knit dryness of oh, yeah. the seventies yeah, yeah, yeah. into like, there was a lot of like punk influence, like early punk stuff in a lot of pop music from the eighties. Like there's so much pop music where the, the vocalist doesn't sound like he should be the vocalist of the band where it's just some dude scream, like singing, not necessarily the correct pitches. And it's like iconic. So like, that was like a direct result of how perfect everything had become in the seventies. And so like this being the way that it is, I think makes it special on one hand because it was way drier than I expected it to be in terms of the mixing. Like the guitars were reverby, but not overly so, I didn't think. No. And Lars vo- or uh James' vocals were sh- the most shocking thing to me because I was expecting it to be completely different than what it was. Like I was expecting him to sing in a higher register for, for most of the album. And there were a few songs where it was like, dude, you're singing higher, too higher than you higher than you probably should. Yeah. <laughs> but even still, that was okay. You know, and there's definitely that like imperfection. Like you would listen to something now and they would never hear something like that without auto tune or whatever, whatever all over it. So like that lends to like, to me, the like, n- the, not nostalgia, the, the like the, what's the word? The, I guess like the cuteness of the way that it was done, not cuteness, the like simp- the like limitations of what it was, but also like they're being true to what they're playing way more than you would be now on a record. You know, like you're hearing what they're playing, yeah. mistakes and all. Yeah. And so there's something that's like 
quaint. That's the word I was thinking of. There's like something that's very quaint to the way the whole album was put together. You know, it just seems like it felt way more to me like we were talking beforehand about whether it was going to be like they go into the studio and craft this masterpiece or they just go in and play the songs and record the whole album in like a week. It's really interesting. And I would love to look up the, the story of the album, like how it worked, because it felt like almost like a combination of those two things. I would agree with that. There was like a looseness to everything that was like not necessarily aiming for perfection, which is what we do in music nowadays. Like we have all, so many tools now. There's no reason to ever have a wrong note on a professionally produced album unless you want it to sound wrong intentionally. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas like back then, I almost feel like the quaintness of it is in the simplicity of what they're doing was like just dudes playing in a studio and capturing the sound. But then like Lars vocals, like I said, had all these effects and stuff on them. And James. it was sorry. James vocals had a lot of effects on them and it was very wet, his vocals. But we were having trouble at the first few songs trying to decide whether or not they were actually like doubled or not. And I honestly don't know if I thought that they were doubled. You know, we thought they were maybe For in the second, second track. I did. But then I was thinking more, maybe they just had some sort of like a chorusing effect on them or or the reverb that they were using was such a like a I don't know. I don't know how they did that. Got his vocals to sound that way. Uh, but it definitely sounded very wet. And I didn't mind the way that they sounded. I thought it fit well into the music. I do think the dryness of everything else was maybe a little bit like his vocal stat stood out as like the most obviously produced part of what we were hearing. If that makes sense. Yeah, I guess I can, I guess I can, I guess I can see that. I don't know. I'm just, I, to me, like there was really only like reverb on the guitars and it wasn't the kind of reverb that you notice until one of the guitars goes away or something. Cause then I, there was a couple parts where it was just one guitar. Like all you hear as an effect on the guitars is like reverb. And that's fine. And it wasn't overly done, in my opinion. I thought it still sounded dry enough to be. Yeah, but there's like a cloud of reverb over the whole recording. Right. But but it wasn't. Yes. Yes. But it wasn't. I guess maybe it just wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Because, again, I'm thinking like this stupid black. Like, I'm thinking like Motley Crue or like Striper or something like that. And I don't even like or like I know a lot of people mention like Sabotage as like a cool band like. But to me, I think of that stuff like 80s hair metal, like you hit the snare and it's just like this gigantic oh, wall yeah. of. But, <laughs> but this was but this was, you know, bef before that or right on the cusp. Of right. And before see, that's that. Right. And was see, that's really maybe popular. like a, that's just my ignorance to the to this to that time period, maybe. But like like a, uh, like a lot of the music from the 80s that I know is a lot of the pop music, like Flock of Seagulls is like 1983 yeah. is like I ran so far away. Right. Which I would say is like. 90% better produced than this, but I would expect it to be because that's a pop song. Right. But again, also like that has like money put behind it and studio record label and all this stuff. I think, I don't know, maybe they were like an indie band at the time, but like it's different, but like at the same time, it, it was being recorded at the same time, you know, ish kind yeah. of. And so it's like interesting to think about stuff like that especially because of the limitations that they had at the time of like, you know, this might've even been recorded at the same studio as that. And I don't think it was, but I'm just saying like, it could have been somewhere in London or whatever, probably. But, um, did you say you knew where this one was recorded? I'm pretty sure that it was in, um, Danishville. Let's, let's see. Metallica released its debut album, kill them all on the independent record label, Megaforce records in 1983. The, help, the album helped establish the that I know this is kill them all helped establish thrash metal, a heavy metal subgenre and defined by its bis brisk riffs and intense percussion, blah, 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 brisk. brisk riffs. Metallica began composing new material and from September began performing the songs that began to make ride the lightning up at concerts because the band had little money. Its members often ate one meal a day and stayed at fans homes while playing at clubs across the United States. Uh, and then their gear was stolen and the guy from Anthrax, that's another band that I don't know that much about. Yeah. But they're, what are they? They're more of like a punky band type thing, right? Kind of. The only thing I know about Anthrax is they did that like rap song, bring the noise or whatever yeah. with, with, uh, which that's awesome. <laughs> don't get me started. That on was that. also, that was like five or eight years Oh, that was later, like in the nineties. Yeah. Late eighties, at least 89, 90. Um, but this says the band, Hetfield gradually built confidence as a lead vocalist and kept his original role. They started filming on February 20th, 1984 
at Sweet Silence Studios in Copenhagen, Denmark. The album was produced by Fleming Rasmussen, the founder of Sweet Silence Studios. Drummer Lars Ulrich chose Rasmussen because he liked his work on Rainbow's Difficult to Cure. I don't even know who Rainbow is. Huh. As a band. Uh, that was from 1981. And was keen to record in Europe. He had not heard of Metallica and agreed to work on the album, even though his studio employees questioned the band's talent. He listened to Metallica's tapes before the members arrived and thought the band had great potential. They rehearsed, it says before entering the studio, they collected ideas on riff tape recordings and jam sessions, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, yeah, I guess, I don't know. It's not Metallica initially had sound problems because its gear was stolen. The band members slept in the studio by day as they could not afford a hotel by night. So they would record the studio was booked by other artists during the daytime. So they recorded at night and then they slept in the, in the studio during the day because other artists had to use it, I guess, or something like that. So that tells me that this was not like maybe they did put a bunch of effort into it. It says the original album budget was twenty thousand dollars, but the final expense was over thirty thousand. It was a lot of money. It was a lot of money for especially for a band that wasn't like super established. Metallica was un unhappy with the lack of promotion and they decided to part ways with their record label. Um, then they signed to Elektra, which is what this album was on. So, okay. I guess that doesn't really help too much. It says ride the lightning is the last Metallica album to feature co-writing contributions from former lead guitarist, Dave Mustaine, Dave Mustaine, who received credit on the title track and call of Cthulhu. Cthulhu. The album was also represented as the first time Hammett was given writing credits. So that doesn't tell us too much about how they recorded it, but it does say that they were had no money, basically. Uh, so that's really interesting then. So you have to take that into consideration. Like, you can't expect this to sound like something that was pushed. Mean, but it's not a garage recording. No, no. But also it doesn't sound much better than the garage recording. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Again, it's it depends on your, like, I guess I just need more reference for stuff from around the time, you know? Because when I think of like what year was like girls, 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 my Motley Crue and stuff like that. 87. So like around the same time. And to me, I think of that as having just like all this crazy wild production thrown at it. But I know that that's a different kind of a thing. Yeah, it's totally Like that has thing. background vocals and keyboards and all sorts of weird. I don't know if it's keyboards, but there's all sorts of different stuff in that. And this wasn't meant to be that, right? This was yeah. meant to be more of a like. Underground metal record. Right, exactly. But the fact that it does sound as good as it does probably was surprising maybe at the time. Yeah. So again, you have to take that into consideration too. But I just, I don't think that it sounds that good. Like overall, I would not say that it sounds good. Mm, I don't, no, I, don't it sounds yeah. I don't think it sounds bad. I don't think it sounds bad at all. But like, like I said, it just felt very the same the whole time. And, and I would say maybe a little bit, it wasn't as thin as I thought it was going to be. But I don't know also how much of that would be like affected by the, um, like listening to the original vinyl might be a little bit more dynamic just cause that's how vinyl works, but also like listening to the original copy on like CD, how would that have sounded compared to the remaster that we listened to? You know, maybe there would have been way more differentiation from track to track. I bet to dealing with volume, I'll maybe. bet it was a lot less uniform from track to track, but the uniformity of it was also, I think a positive or a strength of it. So I don't yeah. know. I would say I liked I was going to just say I liked the slow songs overall more than the faster songs. Mm. But I don't even know if I could say that because I do really like like at the beginning of the album, the few things that really shocked me the most was when they started like guitar harmonizing solos and stuff. I was like, this is awesome. I didn't really expect that too much. And obviously, I know that guitar Metallica does like harmonized parts. I guess I knew that. But I can't really like there isn't a ton of that on uh, Black Album, I don't think. But there's a lot more layering on Black Album. So that that is, you know, I wasn't expecting this to sound like that, but there was a chance that it could have. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there could have been a lot of layering and things, but there wasn't. And I guess I'm kind of torn. That's where my like my that's where I'm kind of torn, because like on one hand, I appreciate the the simplicity of it. And like I said, the quaintness of it. But on the other hand, like I could see how this could have been better had they had the technology and the time and the, you know, the, the, well, yeah, but earlier, stuff, but you before can't... we started doing this, you were talking about, and I, you were largely right that like the first, the first record a band does, they usually don't know what they're doing. And mm -hmm. so maybe the songs are really good, but usually the production is really bad. Right. But if you go 
zoom out a little bit on this. This is how we can tell we're getting towards the end of the video because I'm going to get philosophical here. Mm -hmm. But if you zoom out a little bit and think about that the whole world was kind of making the first metal records. Right. Be, be, right. I mean, because there was other stuff that, you no, know. No, but that's, that's so. exactly what I keep saying. Like, I'm trying to... I'm trying... But... It's a professional recording. Yes, yes, I know. But then I think of like the stuff I've heard from like Black Sabbath, right? Which is way before this that I do think maybe sounds like sonically better than this. It's slower. But it's slower. But like, what would that really impact? It, the fact that it's slower. Everything. I mean, I guess, but not really though. But also he's not doing the vocals the same way. But also it's way drier and it was that was in the 60s and the 70s. So like obviously there's just a different style well, for sure. But like, but like I mean, the t I think the tempo thing is huge. Um, but like, I mean, you you couldn't have had technical death metal in 1984, not in the way that we know it today. And I'm very much talking about Arch Spire, but mm -hmm. um, like you couldn't have had that because like you, you didn't have drum samples you probably didn't have um, people. Uh, oh, God, am I about to show my audio misknowledge here? But like you have to have super fast processing to be able to do those sorts of things. Oh, and sure. like probably nobody had ever even thought to do that or, you know, using, you know, super hard gates and compressors on right. kick drums and snare drums to get them to just like beat the snot out of you. Mm -hmm. Right. And like um, or people using uh snares side chain to the guitar bus in 1984 no because no one ever needed to do it before right no and you're like right. you know there was all that stuff that people were still figuring out and like yeah i mean it doesn't sound by modern standards i would agree that that doesn't sound good but i don't again i don't think it sounds bad though either and i will say like I the mentioned. riffs are sweet they are cool you know but also again like i'm not a guitar guy so like i it's hard for me to listen to a guitar riff and just be impressed by like what it is. You know, yeah. what I'm looking for is like something that sounds cool. I know, you know, but like I'm trying to appreciate it for the, for what it is as well. Cause like, I don't want to make it seem like I was negative on it. Although I could be, if I was talking about structuring at all, which I didn't care for at all. <laughs> and you probably knew that because of everything I was saying beforehand, like you're going to hate this because of the structuring and the fact that of, I believe of the, Eight songs, six faded out. <laughs> no, I think six at least five for sure. We could have counted. We, I usually I keep a mental tally, and at the end of the video, I give it a score based on if it was eight, if it was six out of eight, it would be a two, <laughs> a two out of eight. <laughs> but I didn't keep track of that because there was so much other stuff to talk to talk about. But I think that. Double bass was something that shocked me. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I, again, we talked so much beforehand. Like I knew that there was double bass before 1991 or whatever, but, uh, it was fun to hear it. And that was even another thing where like, you could clearly tell the limitations of what they were recording with that. Like when you hear double bass now, it's the same hit every time. Like go listen to Lux Eterna. Yeah, that sounds great, though. But that's different because it was slow. It doesn't sound great. It sounds fine. I thought it sounded really it good. It sounds unbelievably fake. Now, that is unexcusable. Metallica. I guess I don't. Yeah. That is unexcusable. <laughs> it sounds It sounds like a very expensive demo. I, I get I don't know. I I don't. I guess. I don't know. I, that's the thing. Like, I thought Lux Eterna sounded really good. But maybe my expectations were low because I've heard so much about the negative things about Metallica's production. About just like why they can't they make an album that sounds like a good metal record, you know? But I don't know. Have have they? That's my was gonna I was gonna ask you that. Like I don't know. I I like I like the way that some of the newer ones sound, and I've gotten beat up by my friends for saying some of my favorite songs from the last few Metallica records. Uh, uh Death Magnetic, the CD version of it was just absolutely ruined in mastering. Really? But, right, and that was a whole that was a big deal because it was Metallica. Um, and it was over compressed. It's so so bad. Really? Okay. It was it was like. I re that might have been that might have been the experience. I remember what vehicle I was in. I remember where I was at. I remember where I bought that CD and listening to it. And like then I was like light bulb went off. I'm like, oh, this is what over compression sound sounds mm. like or over limiting. And 
you know, so it was a big deal because the Guitar Hero version of that, they remastered it for that. Oh. And then that was a big deal. And it sounded way better. Yeah, because it was less compressed. Mm, and that might that's be, that's probably what's on the streaming services now. I don't really know. Really? That's I, really. I thought some of the stuff from Hardwired was fine, but let's. Oh, uh, that's right. Hardwired to Self Destruct. Yeah. I was like, I knew they had another album somewhere out there. Yeah. Is that their most recent one? Or yeah. was Death Magnetic one? No, Death Magnetic was. So before. Hardwired to Self. And then Saint Anger before that. Yeah. And then. Low reload load. I think that that was the order. Yeah. Okay. Cause, cause when I think of like, when I think of what and it's different again, like I do think that black album sounds really good, but like, it's basically just kick. Like the kick is the loudest thing on, at least in the remastered version. When I was listening on to the rich one, sorry on black album. Oh, the, the, but again, I know that that's different because that's more of like rock music or whatever than metal. Although yeah. whatever, that's whatever here nor there, but, 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 but <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know what we're talking about anymore. I guess just quality of recording and stuff and, and whatnot. But I, I I liked it. I will say it didn't really blow me away as much as I wanted to. And I think maybe if I sat and listened to it without talking over it, maybe I would have appreciated it more. And I don't necessarily say that for a lot of things. But I feel like with this, like there was so much prog in this. Just because, like, to me, when I think of, like, prog metal, I think of, like, long sections, long, long instrumental sections. And there were long instrumental sections in this that did not have a solo over it, mm. where they would just, like, play a riff for a while, and then they'd switch up the riff and play that for a while. And, like, part of me wonders if that's because James was the singer and also the guitar player. Like, if they had a singer in the band that wasn't the uh. guitar player, would the singer have been like, hey, it's been too long since I sang... You know, I've just been I've been standing here with nothing to do for five minutes at the end of this song. Let me put another chorus or something in there. Like I definitely would I would have appreciated that. So so part of me is just like and like I like I don't like listening to instrumental music. Like it's hard for me to listen to instrumental music, hmm. which is really interesting because like my favorite kind of music to listen to is music in other languages. So I don't even understand what the vocalist is saying at all. Yeah. Just listening to it and having the voice be like a different instrument or whatever mm. so you would think that t that would translate over into like instrumental music but i have a hard time with instrumental and especially instrumental metal like i get so many uh, recommendations for that stuff on facebook and spotify and stuff and i'll find like a really cool band and i'll listen to the first like four like the first minute of a song and it sounds awesome and then i'll like click around and there's no vocals anywhere on the album and i'm just like why did you waste my time with this <laughs> well i don't want to listen to a metal without vocals i guess so I don't know what that is, but like, so like that last song, I definitely would say that I was bored with that one a little bit. And I, that's not saying that I wouldn't be able to appreciate it at all, but like, I don't know. It's a really strange thing because I just, I will go out of my way to say that I don't care about vocals that much, but I guess I like the idea of there being something to focus on to like, let you know what section of the song you're in. And if you're have a songs that don't really have, any structuring to this to this to there the, is instrument there's the even instrumental guitar music that's like that oh sure i'm sure almost all i mean all instrumental music is really like that but there are repeating there parts. are some that are really more obvious than, e right for yeah. sure but like this like i said it felt like the first half of the song was like a more regular song mm -hmm. and then the back half was just them noodling around on the guitar and i don't say noodling like f jazz like they weren't like l improvising stuff a lot of it was soloing over the top of riffs that i thought sounded cool but they just repeated the riffs maybe like two or three times more than i felt they needed to and then you then they have the solos over the top of it and stuff so it just it just felt like something that maybe you should see live and have like the oh, guys I mean, that was absolutely like that was absolutely like the idea. I know, but I don't like that. I know you don't. I don't like live music and I don't care about I'm it. And I I'm very proud you. of how well you did with that. But I, I was expecting much right. more negative. Right. I guess maybe that's it. it felt, part of it felt like jammy kind of, you know, like a like, but not like improvising, yeah. but just like, you know, the end of the song is just a band playing a guitar riff for a while. And you can just you can just picture them on stage playing and like walking around and you can envision it very clearly. And yeah, maybe that's the thing. Like, I just don't like that. I don't care for that as much, but like for whom the bell tolls is like, obviously like an awesome song, yeah. like really cool. 
I, that was probably my favorite song on the album, I would say. But also, I really did like <laughs> You're Gonna Hate This. That Escape song was so that. cool. I, I it was really good. <laughs> but maybe that's just because that was my, like, I'll bet if I listened to it, I would say, like, my favorite riffs were probably Fight Fire with Fire and Trapped Under the Ice because those were just, like, the more fast ones. So I felt like that was more, like, like I was trying to like listen and be like, oh, what, what does this remind me of? Or like, what band does this kind of feel like? And and a lot of this stuff made me think of your band, which because that's probably a lot of the, the closest I have to certain um, like a relating it to something that I know really well. Um, and just a lot of the metal I listen to is more rhythmic based rather than like lead based. Mm. And so this was definitely like lead based, even when it comes to the riffs, like a lot of the riffs weren't even necessarily like a, a rhythmic riff. It was like a leading type of riff. Mm. And then like, even with Hatfield singing over the top of that stuff, like I never felt like the guitars were clashing with what he was singing really. But there were a few moments where I was asking you if he was known for being like a guitar player that plays what he's singing, because some guitar players have trouble with that, you know, where you, when you're writing a chorus for a song, you come up with the, part you're playing on the guitar and then the words you're saying just go with the guitar part you're playing yes does that make sense yes and so like i was wondering if he was doing that because i heard that several times and that was some of the vocal stuff that stuck out to me because i felt like it was working really well with the guitar part rather than just having like a complex guitar part and then singing over the top of it you know the first two songs i think i mentioned like there wasn't much pitch fluctuation to his voice at all he was just like doing the same note you know he was just singing the same or like it's not like a shouty rat. It's like a raspy kind of, he has a very different way of singing, I guess, from a lot of other bands that I know of, which is kind of cool. He's definitely a unique singer. And when I think of him singing now, I guess it's very similar to the way he would have sang then. Mm. So he's very consistent, I guess, over his career, which is pretty cool though. He obviously sings a lot more clean vocals. Like again, black album is the thing that I know the most. And like, there's just something so badass about like, you know what i felt what i've known never shine through and what i feel like he's literally just singing there and that's really cool and it's a really freaking cool melody and it's awesome and everything in this song is working together to create something that's really cool yes whereas this i felt was more like let's just have guitar riffs and then it doesn't really matter so much what the vocals are doing over the top of it especially in that first song it was very like monotonous but maybe that was intentional and that's what he was trying to like go for but then like when it got to track three, which I think was for whom the bell tolls, then it was like, OK, now we're going to sing. We're going to have like a noticeable melody in the vocals and the guitar part is much more melodic. And then there were like that was a, the thing, the first part time we got to like the like more chuggy guitar riffs mm. that were like more like da dum da 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 dum like I guess more of something that could fit more on the Black Album than, you know, even though there are some faster thrashy stuff on Black Album, but like. So that was the that was that was when I was like I could see this band in six years making the Black Album, yeah, you know. But before that, with the first two songs, it would have been hard, and I was just anticipating the whole album being like those first two songs and having it be like a completely different band than the band that made the Black Album. And so it was very refreshing to me to have in really all the songs had little sections in them that I think like would have worked on the Black Album maybe or like been something that would have been similar to it. So like, yeah, I don't know. I feel like uh, um, I feel like I, I, I'm kind of conflicted. <laughs> I am. I really am because it's like I can't imagine myself listening to that again for recreation. Yeah, I believe it. You know, which is I don't know. And I don't know that I don't I don't know that I would. Yeah. If I. If I don't, if I hadn't had like the, the nostalgia factor, yeah, stuff. and I yeah. mean I wasn't around when it came out, but I, um, I guess in a way I had forgotten how many times I've listened to that record sure. until we were doing it sure. again. I'm pretty sure that's my brother's favorite Metallica record. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, I get it. It doesn't sound that great, and if you're into pop song structure, I understand why you wouldn't like it. Mm -hmm. But I was, I'm overall very impressed by how you do. You people well, probably know, but that's way outside of the genre and way outside of production style for Patrick. So, yeah. Well, I remember the first time you you 
found out that I was going to go back and listen to like the first Children of Bodom album. And you're like, don't, don't do it. You can't do it. And I listened to it and I was like, this isn't that bad. And you were like, really? You were shocked. And so I think part of that is though, just like managing expectations. And that's why I keep going back to like what I perceive as like the limitations of the recording because like, but, but then I think of like, and I don't know if this is relevant at all, but like, I remember people being so disappointed with St. Anger. And I remember there being some metal band online that was like trying to build, don't, they were trying to get funds to re record the entire somebody album. Did it. Yeah, but, but like a modern metal record. Yeah, somebody did it. Well, does that sound better than St. Anger? Probably. Well, then what the hell is Metallica doing? Everything sounds better than Metallica. That's <laughs> what Metallica is great. I'm here to tell what you. What the heck is that so part weird? Part of what makes Metallica great, at least for me, is that okay. they just colossally up sometimes that, that, that's swear word number four i'm sorry but they like they 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 do terrible things right and that's like that's, that's why the cool. lulu that's why the lulu thing is great and the, right it's not supposed to be metallic or whatever but right. like it's terrible but that it, it is truly awful i guess i just have to like that's cool like they're like a quirkiness to the band that i just i guess i didn't know of yeah you know? that like they that they're this huge band i think and like largely I mean, fight me, internet, but, like, the reason Metallica is Metallica is because of the Black Album. I mean, that's, you know, other than that, they'd be, you know, they'd be Slayer at best. And I am also here to tell you that Metallica songs are not as good as Slayer songs. Um, they do not have nearly as consistent of a discography because you can listen to every Slayer record and they're all great. Okay. And it's not that way with Metallica. But, you know, whatever, Load and Reload and Lulu and whatever – St. Anger. Um, that's part of what makes Metallica great to me. Right. Is that, is that some of the stuff is just bad. And like, I think that these two records that we'll at least listen to on here. I mean, I think that those are the ones that, you know, by true metal people or whatever are the ones that are pretty safe and, and kill them all too. But, you know, justice has mixed reviews and, and then everything including and after the black album you know you don't know what people are gonna think and that's kind of like i could see that being like kind of the fun aspect of it like what are we gonna get metallica released yeah i mean that is absolutely like that's why that's why because i've watched so many people react to lux eterna and like everybody starts the video out like super trepidatious because they're like metallica just dropped a new single what what are we gonna get and then like they listen to it and they're like Oh, and then, it's the, not and then the moment the guitar riff starts, you know, and it's that da 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 they're all like, oh, this is like old Metallica. <laughs> and then the drums kick in and they're like, oh, they, OK, all right. And then Kirk does that weird solo and they're like, oh, OK. <laughs> and people are generally very positive about the song in all the reactions I've seen. And the best reaction I saw, by the way, was like, I wish I remember the name of the channel. I think it was just like a guitar guy or something, but it was just this normal looking dude who listened to the song and then sat there and figured out all the guitar parts and he just was so charming and really fun to watch but also hearing him talk about the guitar riffs and the like variances between like the main riff and stuff that they do in the chorus and then the intro was really cool and it was really cool to hear him break down the song so i'm sorry i wish i could look that up i don't have that information with me now but like guitar guy re i think it was guitar teacher reacts was what it was called uh -huh. guitar teacher, but it was this young dude that just was really cool. Um, but anyway, that's, what's fun. Like, cause everybody starts the videos out. Like they don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And like not being a Metallica person, like, I don't know. That's the feeling I'm supposed to have. Yes. To me, it's just like Metallica is like the biggest band in the world. And it should always be the greatest thing of all time because it, it's Metallica. It never is. <laughs> it, it like, it never is. That's so interesting. That's, what, that's, that's so what makes interesting. Metallica great. It's because oh. they might just drop a giant turd. <laughs> and like, <laughs> that's what makes it so much fun. <laughs> I love it. Okay, well, we'll end the video here for here. I feel like we've done enough. Hopefully, people got a little bit of entertainment out of that. I know we talked for so long, but I really do feel like I had, personally, I had a lot of fun. Uh, hopefully we weren't too annoying. And I know a lot of people do get really mad at me when I just talk over the music a lot, but I have perfected the art of listening to 20 seconds of a song and ju passing judgment on it. So like, whatever, <laughs> if you don't have that skill, that's, that's your, you can go listen to the album yourself. <laughs> right. And that's the other thing too. Like people sometimes get mad. Like, why are you talking about the music? I can't hear it. But it's like, that's not the purpose of this 
to me, the purpose is for you to see, hear my reaction and my thoughts on what I'm hearing for the first time as I'm hearing it, not for you to just sit there and listen to it. Though I also do really appreciate if I can include the music in the video so you can hear along with me what I'm hearing. So hopefully I can do that. But I never asked this on my channel ever. And Chris alluded to it earlier. I don't know if you were joking or not, but like, I am planning to do this, Master of Puppets, uh, Justice for All, and then eventually when we get to 72 seasons. So I never ask for people to subscribe to my channel. I only have like 300 subscribers and I only average like maybe 30 to 50 views per video. And for the amount of effort that I put into these, I feel like it maybe should be more slightly. But like if you are interested in hearing my thoughts on the other Metallica albums, which I promise we won't need to talk as long on those videos because I've already established and said everything I wanted to say in this video. So we can just more like get into those albums and discuss maybe those albums intent specifically a little bit more. Uh, subscribe to my channel and keep a lookout for it. I don't care if you want subscribe to me after I'm done with Metallica, but maybe you'll see some of my other reactions coming up on my channel. I have In Flames later this week that I'm going to record. I am super excited for Ellie Goulding's fourth uh, album. And if you know who Ellie Goulding is and you're a Metallica fan, good on you. You have a very wide range of, of you know, just a British pop lady. She's so fantastic, though. She, so good. Anyway, she takes risks. Whatever. I don't need to get into it. But we got that. We got Depeche Mode. We got And One coming out later this year. We got so much good stuff. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to a lot of really cool things. I also have Termion Catalot came out with a new album recently and also Lord of the Lost. And those are two sort of like German style. Like I hate to say like Rammstein because I hate Rammstein, but it's more like Oomph, which is the band that actually influenced Rammstein into who they are but like two albums of that sort of like german industrial metal that i absolutely love even though i know german catalog is from finland but like those two albums i'm very much looking forward to i probably won't do reactions to those but uh there's so much good music already out this year and we're only in february uh, plus the arcs album that just came out last week that i posted my review of earlier this week so Think about subscribing to my channel, like the video, whatever. I don't care about that kind of stuff. I can't monetize anything. I don't have enough subscribers to like partner with YouTube or anything like that. But think about it, whatever. If um, if you love Metallica and you want to hear more of my thoughts on it, subscribe. At least keep an eye out in your, your recommendeds or whatever for this. So thank you, Chris, for coming. Thank you for and having me. Yeah, it's so, I mean, we we could just, I'm pretty sure people could tell. This is what we do on, we could just on talk, video a lot. Yeah, we could just talk about music <laughs> forever. And we didn't even get, to, we didn't even talk about, we, we did talk about a lot of production stuff, but it was just pertaining to this, which is obviously what we needed to do. We couldn't expand our, the conversation too far out of that, or we'd be going forever. So, all right, two minutes and 39 seconds into the recording. I'd say that's enough. Thank you very much, and I will see you next time.